Welcome uh, to this symposium, New Perspectives on the Lion in Mourning. Uh, my name is Leith Davis, and I'm delighted to welcome you this morning to our symposium. This is symposium is designed to share research about a partnership project engaging public and academic audiences to recover lost voices of Scottish history. The Lion and Morning Manuscript and the Jacobite Networks of the 1745 Rising. So it's a meeting that's taking place here at uh, the Institute for Advanced Studies um, in the Humanities at Edinburgh University. And it's also being recorded remotely. So hello to everybody who is remote, as well as everybody who is here in person. I want to thank IESH for their generous support for this project. And I also want to acknowledge the support of the National Library of Scotland, Simon Fraser University's Department of English, and the Digital Humanities Innovation Lab at Simon Fraser University, and generous support as well from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Um, together, all of those bodies and organizations have made this, this project possible. I want to begin as well by acknowledging that this project was formulated and part of the work was done um, on the unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. And I think living and working on lands which were occupied and whose people had been subjected to the violences of colonialism makes us very aware of the multiple ways in which histories get told, erased, um, reconceived and represented and occluded. I want to give you a bit of background on our project to begin with. Um, so this was a project that was designed to generate new interest and research on the Lion and Morning manuscript and in Jacobitism in general for both academic and general audiences. The first stage of this project actually began here, well, didn't begin here uh, physically, we began here remotely with um, the support of IASH uh, for the digitization and display of the manuscript and work um, uh, with the National Library of Scotland and uh, thanks to Ralph McLean and Francine Millard, as well as SFU's DHIL, Digital Humanities Innovation Lab. So that in enabled us to do step one, which was the digitization and display of the line and morning manuscript. And it is now available to the public, to everybody, um, through Simon Fraser University's digitized collections. Um, it's a little bit of a clunky website at this point, but we're hoping that that will change over the ne next while. The entire manuscript, all 10 volumes then are available uh, for digital display and consultation. Yay! <laughs> um, as if that wasn't enough. <laughs> stage two, moving on to the, the second stage of the project. This was a shirk funded partnership project between the National Library of Scotland and Simon Fraser University's Research Centre for Scottish Studies and the Digital Humanities Innovation Lab. And um, this was definitely the partnership in time of COVID. So we organized this basically by splitting the objectives, the job ex objectives. We had our Edinburgh team, Ralph McLean and our research assistant, Harry Lewis. Uh, their focus was on evaluating the representation of the line in mourning in the catalogs and the records of the National Library of Scotland, and also to attempt to identify any original papers of Forbes. Um, in the NLS and National, National Records Scotland. In the manuscript, Forbes is constantly saying, it's in my papers, it's in my, I mean, papers, it's in my papers. And our question was, where are those papers? <laughs> where do they exist? And I think we've, we've well, I'll let Harry say that. I won't, I won't give that away. So. Um, so the Edinburgh team then working on those two objectives. From our side of the Atlantic, the SFU team, uh, it's consisting of myself, Joy Takeda, who's a user interface developer from the Digital Humanities Innovation Lab, um, our wonderful set of, 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 of research assistants, uh, now including Jasmine Bojackley, Taylor Breckles, uh, Shauna Irani, Emma Trotter, who is unfortunately unable to be here today, Juliana Wager, 
and our previous research assistants, Alyssa Bridgman and Caitlin McInnes, who have all just done a fabulous job. Now, our focus is um, on employing qualitative and quantitative digital humanities methodologies to analyze the manuscript and also to mobilize those findings for academic and general audiences. So we are spotlighting in particular stories of female, laboring class, and Gaelic-speaking individuals. Um, so we are going to move on to the first official set of talks. And I want to just introduce people, um, all three of our speakers, so that we are a little bit seamless going from one speaker to the other. So I ask you to, to remember uh, and to note uh, the following. I'd like to introduce to you Ralph McLean, who, uh, as I said, was really at the heart of all this, help, helping this get underway from the very get-go, and, and his support has been invaluable and on this, um, as, his, as the support of the National Library of Scotland has. So Ralph is curator of 18th century manuscripts at the National Library of Scotland. Uh, he's published widely on Scottish studies topics and also co-edited Scottish Enlightenment and Literary Cultures, Culture of Bucknell University Press, which some of you may be familiar with. The next speaker will be Robert Betteridge, who is Rare Books Curator of 18th century printed collections at the National Library of Scotland. And um, our speaker, uh, last speaker is Harry Lewis, who is a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh working on a thesis entitled The Jacobite Diaspora, the Stuart Court, and the Greater Caribbean, 1688 to 1750. Um, he holds the William R. McFarland Scholarship for 2019, 2022. And I gather you are this far away from completion, yeah? Well, hopefully. <sighs> hopefully. I'm sure. I have no doubt, absolutely. So please join me in welcoming our first pan set of panelists. Um, and I'll just invite Ralph McLean to start us off. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to take my mask off to do the talk and I'll put it back on again once I've uh, finished. Um, Okay, so um, I'll get going quickly because we had 15 minute slots. So the line of mourning uh, has a rich and varied history from its creation by Robert Forbes until it eventually came into the possession of the National Library of Scotland. And for the purposes of this talk, I shall confine my discussion to the arrival of the manuscripts. Um, a lot of people saw them yesterday, but here's where they sit on the shelf in the library. Um, and I'll confine it to um, the discussion of the arrival of the manuscripts at the Faculty of Advocates Library and how they've been treated and used by the library in subsequent years. So the Line of Mourning has long been recognised as a treasure of the library's collections, but as we shall see, it has often been deployed in very specific ways to draw attention to it. So in 1871, the volumes were in the possession of the publisher and author Robert Chambers. And following his death, they were bequeathed to the Faculty of Advocates Library. And the bequest was of such note that it was recognised in the press at the time, with an article outlining the importance of the collection for Jacobite history. Indeed, a cutting of the article was pasted onto a blank page of the first volume of Lion and Morning. Here is that uh, manuscript, uh, along with the press cutting. Now, the piece notes that Chambers left specific instructions for the manuscripts. Uh, it was that my trustees shall deliver to the Faculty of Advocates for preservation in their library a manuscript in ten volumes entitled The Lion in Mourning. Now the article notes that such a gift will ensure that it will now belong to a library in Scotland which is accessible to the investigation of historians. And indeed it was the generosity of the faculty in making their collections available to view that was a crucial factor in receiving them as a gift. Uh, because the publishing house of Chambers had frequently used the Advocates Library as a storehouse for knowledge of their own publications. And indeed, the library was critical to the function of the, extension of the extensive publishing industry which was based in the city. Now, having related that the bequest was of such note that it was recorded in the press, it's perhaps somewhat surprising that it was not noted in the faculty's record books. Um, and thanks to the library's cataloging system, we do know that the bequest was recorded on the 14th of August, 1871. However, there are no references to this at all in the minute books of the curators. 
Indeed, the first mention of Lion and Morning in the Minutes did not occur until October 1892, when they had been contacted by the Secretary of the Scottish History Society for permission to examine the manuscript. At this stage, the intent was similar to approaches to the work in the past, because they only wished to examine the manuscripts in order to identify and transcribe portions of the manuscripts which may have been suitable for publication. This was granted by the faculty on the 26th of October 1892, but there are no further references to its publication. And even in 1895, by which time the decision had clearly been made to publish the majority of the manuscripts in three printed volumes, there's no reference to the publication, although there are further notifications of approaches by the Scottish History Society to use library materials as the basis for subsequent publications. And even the full entry of Lion and Morning into the Faculty of Advocates catalogues came after the publication of the volumes in the Scottish History Society series, as you can see here in this image. Now, while this may be surprising for something of iconic status, it was not unusual for materials in the Advocates Library to remain in an uncatalogued state owing to staff shortages and inadequate time to be available to devote to cataloging collections. Um, nothing new there. Um, now, that isn't to say that the materials could not be found. Uh, they would have been assigned a shelf location and a basic description to allow them to be retrieved from strong rooms. However, a fuller description of the volumes would not have been available until the first decade of the 20th century, when some of the backlog was tackled in more detail. Uh, and even then, the description was fairly basic, but it does note that the volumes were published by the Scottish History Society, which you can see at the bottom there. Now, despite the lack of entries in the minute books and its late appearance in the catalogues, the Lion and Morning was evidently an important addition to the library's collections. In 1889, the Glasgow Herald ran a series of three articles focusing on the history and the site of the Advocates Library. In order to demonstrate to the public exactly the sort of treasures that they should be or that they could expect to find in the library, the third article in the series was dedicated to collections held at the faculty's library. Now, from a manuscript creator's point of view, it's interesting to see that the majority of this article is actually given over to the description of the library's important manuscripts rather than to its printed book collections. Um, indeed, to praise the library for the access that they had been given to the public so far, the paper was keen to note that the manuscripts at the Faculty of Advocates Library had always been open to literary research, and therefore many of them had already been made use of in printed works. Now, at the very time that the article was published, on the 30th of November, 1889, both the original manuscript of Waverley, which was donated to the library in 1850, and the line of mourning were on display in a glass case in the Advocates Library. Um, here's a, an image of the Waverley manuscript. Um, although Scott's hand is incredibly difficult to read, this is actually the passage where um, Waverley meets Bonnie Prince Charlie. Um, but you have to take my word for that. Um, so the reference to Waverley is intriguing, as this manuscript appeared to be a perennial favourite for display. It was in the glass case here in 1889, and was out later again in 1902 when the keeper of the Faculty of Advocates Library noted that it was in a case along with a copy of the National Covenant of 1638. Now certainly this would have been closed to members of the public from simply walking in to view the material, um, but as the library did try to do its best to accommodate researchers as much as possible, there would have been a reasonable chance for researchers to be able to view the material once they'd gained access to the library. Unfortunately, there are no surviving records to indicate why these manuscripts were selected for this display, whether they were put out to showcase important treasures or whether there was some Jacobite theme that was underlining their selection. Um, but either way, the Herald has chosen to draw attention to these manuscripts as national treasures, uh, which is this point where it's effectively still held in private, Latin, uh, private hands. So the keeper of the Faculty of Advocates Library, William K. Dixon, who would go on to become the first national librarian of Scotland, wrote a number of articles on the key collections of the Advocates Library, and he published them in the Juridical Review in 1902. Um, now, the line of mourning would have been fresh in Dixon's mind, as the volumes had recently been published as part of the Scottish History Society series, as mentioned, and Dixon was certainly convinced of their importance, as he believed that the perennial interest taken in the events of 1745 was due in no small part to the exertions of Forbes. However, in this, he could only really have been referring to, at the earliest, the publication of Chambers in 1834, as prior to this, we know that the manuscript rarely left the possession of Forbes while he lived, um, and it wasn't used all that much, or even widely known about, um, 
up to the point where uh, Chambers came along to publish parts of it. And the fullest version published to date had only taken place seven years prior to Dixon's article. So shortly before the start of the First World War in the Edinburgh Evening News, uh, they published an article on the 20th of June 1914 on the potential formation of the National Library of Scotland, which was at that point closer to establishment than at any um, previous point in the nation's past. And once again, access to existing collections was of paramount importance to those studying the history of Scotland. The Edinburgh Evening News gave a figure of over 3,000 volumes of manuscripts that formed part of the library's collections. And once again, the line of mourning was cited as one of the key treasures of the library. Notably, not much explanation accompanied the reference to the manuscript, which would indicate that the mention of the volumes on their own would be enough for the reading public to understand and comprehend the significance of the manuscripts. And as we'll go on to discover about the volumes, part of their appeal for their public display is actually, well, shelter your ears, less to do with the important information contained within the volumes, but rather the aesthetic value um, that the volumes contain. Uh, and in particular, the relics that are associated with the Jacobites, especially Charles Edward Stewart himself. Um, so I'm sure everyone has seen um, this page, and it's, um, this is the one that's currently out on display. Well, um, actually, I think it's the reverse, the tartan image is at the back of that volume. Um, it's out on display at the moment at the library. So Forbes was a keen collector of these relics, and when he was able to obtain them, uh, he added them to his volumes with explanations as to how they were acquired and their significance to the Jacobite story. Um, a number of publications that have been released over the years to celebrate the library's treasures almost inevitably includes The Lion in Mourning. In the 1960s, a publication focusing on facsimile copies of notable accessions up to 1925 also included a selection from the manuscript. This time, however, even though the aesthetic appeal of the volume may have naturally been assumed to be the relics attached to the volumes, an actual image of the text was selected. Um, on this occasion, the image focuses on Flora MacDonald, um, and as such, it's the cachet of her name um, and the associated deeds that's the hook to catch the audience's attention. The passage in question outlines how Flora and the Prince met, thanks to the intervention of Captain Felix O'Neill. Uh, and this volume focuses very much on the visual, um, and other than to indicate the title or the author of the manuscript, gives no further information. It's just the, uh, the image with a brief description at the bottom. Um, a similar publication titled Treasures of the National Library of Scotland, published in 1979, um, certainly noted the importance of the manuscripts, but its very basic nature didn't allow for any more than a brief description of the material contained in the volumes. And unlike previous library texts, didn't even include an image from the collection. Um, that's all the description you get. Uh, and it's interesting that whoever's put this together has cited the volume which is volume three, which has all the rel or the majority of the relics. They haven't even given like the full extent of the of the manuscripts. Um, so Louise Yeoman um, used extracts from the Lion and Morning in her 2000 publication, Reportage Scotland, which was a volume designed to provide insights into key parts of Scottish history through eyewitness accounts. As a former curator at the National Library of Scotland, Louise's book concentrated on the wide array of sources and resources held at the library. And so one of the central elements of the book is that all the sources cited are made up of collections held at the library. As one would expect, the Jacobite uprisings were fully represented, with the line in mourning a perfect source for amplifying the voices of these eyewitnesses. The selected passage focuses on the experiences of those who lived on Canna and is an evocative description of the killing of livestock designed to bring about the starvation of inhabitants, with one of its first victims being a heavily pregnant woman. However, while the selection clearly illustrates the value of the Lion of Mourning as a source of first-hand descriptions of the Jacobite Risings, the source itself is given as the Scottish History Society's printed edition, which appeared in the 1890s. So while the library certainly does hold this edition of the work indeed um, in its digitised form, it's currently available on the library's website, there's no mention of the original manuscript and the fact that that's held at the library as well. Um, you know, far less where this passage might actually be found in the volumes themselves. And I think this demonstrates just how occluded the original materials can become, um, because in this instance, the printed volume has come to overshadow the manuscripts themselves. Uh, and this is in a work where manuscript material is heavily used to recover voices from history that have previously become obscured. 
So The Lion in Mourning was featured in the library's in-house magazine in 2009, uh, although once again the prism through which to view the collection and to capture the public's imagination was the material culture items that are attached to the volume. The Lion in Mourning was on display from the 20th of November uh, 2009 until the 4th of January 2010, and indeed part of the justification for its short run was to prevent overexposure of the material that could risk damage to it. Now, the focus on the fabrics is once again used as the hook to engage potential audiences, although in this instance it does allow for a further explanation of material contained in the manuscript volumes themselves. For example, the focus on the piece of cloth from Bertie Burke's gown allows for an exploration of the role that Jacobite soldier Edward Burke played in helping Prince Charles to safety. Uh, and Burke himself recounted that Charles had, quote, no right guide and very few along with him as he escaped from Culloden. And it's Forbes that tells us that it was from Ned's name that Charles took the inspiration of his female alter ego. Now, there's also an accompanying web feature for this display, but it's little more than the full article contained in the Discover magazine with even less images. Um, it's perhaps surprising that in this instance, the usual images of the open front and back boards of the third volume of The Line of Mourning are absent, with, only, with the only visual representation being the title page of The Line in Mourning. And even this image is merely a snapshot of the volume rather than a clickable link to um, a full page image. Now, although these pages on the 2009 treasures items were not designed to showcase the manuscripts in their entirety, clearly the newly digitized suite of volumes available on the Simon Fraser website is a marked improvement in allowing the original manuscripts to be viewed cover to cover. Now, the most recent iteration of Lion in Mourning and its display history brings us up to the present day. In a revamp to the library's existing exhibition space, it was decided to create a permanent treasures display um, or area in which we'd see a focus on some of the most important literary treasures in our collection. In order to start with a bang, important literary works such as the library's copy of the Gutenberg Bible and the manuscript of Robert Burns' iPhone Kiss were earmarked um, for inclusion. Likewise, The Lion of Mourning was again a natural choice as one of the library's key works. Um, and here it is um, on display along with the Battle Map of Culloden um, and Felix O'Neill's journal which is written on the back of the playing cards. Now the plan behind the Treasures Gallery is to showcase materials around key themes and ideas such as the Scots contribution to innovation and design and literary achievements, which is, of course, apt for a national library. The Line in Mourning is in a section on the shaping of the Scottish nation, which is, again, fitting given how the Jacobite Risings were, or how important they were, in forging national identity during the 18th century and the impact that it had on an emerging British identity in the aftermath of the Union of 1707. Once again, the volume on display will feature the cultural artefacts so closely tied to Charles Edward Stuart and his escape from capture. Again, the reason for this is fairly apparent, as the library has to balance visual appeal with text-heavy content in a display that's predominantly text-based. This does create a problem in that the text itself continues to be occluded, hidden behind more eye-catching fabrics and clothes that are associated with romantic stories and attached to the figurehead of the cause. Uh, and this is certainly a trade-off in attempting to engage audiences with the material. Perhaps it is worth the initial effort to draw the gaze of the audience as it in turn can be used to inspire them to engage more fully with the text itself. And just to finish off, I think this demonstrates the significance of the line in mourning. Forbes' meticulous eye for detail and ability to capture and retain these stories not only provides us with a comprehensive overview of the Jacobite uprising using eyewitness accounts, but it also helps to qualify, to recover and to enhance narratives created by others present during the events of 1745 and 46, but which otherwise might have become lost to history. The Faculty of Advocates Library and its successor institution, the National Library of Scotland, have long recognised the importance of Line of Mourning and its role in Scottish history. It has been frequently consulted, displayed and written about. However, the project with Simon Fraser University allows a deeper dive into the manuscripts than ever before and offers real networking opportunities, not just to bring together like-minded people with an interest in the history of the Jacobites, but to explore the network of manuscripts themselves, 
to see how Jacobite sources held in places such as the National Library of Scotland and other institutions such as the National Records of Scotland can connect to and to link to the line in mourning. Thank you. Okay, so this paper isn't intended to give a new perspective on the land in mourning, but rather a short view of the very different situation that the um, Advocates Library found itself in when it came to collecting Jacobite material in the 18th century. Today, the National Library of Scotland holds one of the leading collections of printed material relating to the Jacobites. Though it continues to be added to, most of this material was acquired in the 20th century, and the most significant portion of that arrived not long after the library's foundation in 1925. The collections presented to the library in the 1920s by the Reeds of Lauriston Castle in 1926, Lord Rosebery in 1927, contain a large number of items of Jacobite interest, whilst that presented by the daughters of Walter Bigger Blakey in 1928 is entirely dedicated to material relating to the subject and contains over a thousand printed items and around 400 engravings. The National Library's collections are built upon the approximately 750,000 items gifted to the nation by the Faculty of Advocates. The Advocates Library was officially inaugurated in 1689 with the stated aim of collecting works of jurisprudence, though its collections soon branched beyond this. The memorial for collecting Manuscripts of 1699 was issued with the intention of preserving the nation's records and the purchase of much of the library of historiographer and antiquary James Anderson in 1725 showed the faculty's strong interest in collecting works on history, though this collection is dominated by significant works of the 16th and 17th centuries. Having been founded in the 1680s, the library would seem to have been well placed to collect material relating to the Jacobite movement and its respective risings as they happened, thereby being able to secure material for future historians. Disappointingly, this didn't happen, and though there are items to be found, those works now held in the National Library, printed in support of the Stuarts, were acquisitions mostly made after the Jacobite cause had long lost its ability to threaten the Hanoverian succession. Given the short nature of this talk, I'm going to focus on the period around the 1715 Rising, for which the library has reasonably good records of its acquisitions and accounting. Thinking of the 15, I had a look back at the exhibits that were included in the exhibition the library put on to mark the 300th anniversary of that Rising. Of the printed material in support of the Jacobite cause, it's telling that I could find nothing that was not a post-18th century acquisition. Whether the Advocates Library wanted to collect Jacobite material as it was produced has implications beyond merely what was available in its library. The influence of the Faculty of Advocates on Scotland's cultural and political life, particularly after 1707, has been noted by more than one writer. Historically, the legal profession has been identified as one that supported the Stuarts. In 1654, many leading advocates refused to abjure the monarchy and take the oath of allegiance to the Commonwealth. John Clive, in his chapter, The Social Background of the Scottish Renaissance in Scotland in the Age of Improvement, cites Ramsay of Otter Tyre's claim that the near majority of the Lord's Accession were in favour of the Stuarts, and Alexander Bowers' The History of the University of Edinburgh, which, which was published 1817 to 1830, claims that in the early 18th century, the great majority of the Faculty of Advocates were then strongly attached to the exiled family. Nonetheless, the faculty never made any public pronouncements that were not in support of the settlement of 1688. As John McPherson Pinkerton notes in his introduction to the Minute Book of the Faculty of Advocates, for example, on the, 7th of, sorry, the 2nd of December 1701, it was decided to send a loyal address to King William following Louis XIV's recognition of the pretended Prince of Wales. And 10 days after the Battle of Sheriff Muir, the faculty's members agreed to give in the names of their men servants, which was presumably related to a call 
for people to account for their households during the rising. 30 years later, on the 31st of January 1746, the faculty proposed to appoint a committee to wait upon the Duke of Cumberland to congratulate him on his arrival in the city and to wish him good success in his expedition against the rebels. In the period around the 15, the faculty was led by the Whig politician Sir David Dalrymple, who was Dean of Faculty from 1712 until his death in 1721. So though there may have been sympathy for the Stuart cause within the faculty, his public pronouncements and leading figure were loyal to the Hanoverian succession. The faculty's most often cited brush with Jacobitism in the early years of the 18th century occurred when it accepted, but subsequently returned, the Jacobite medal presented by Elizabeth, Duchess of Gordon, on the 30th of June, 1711. This generated a number of publications, none of which, perhaps unsurprisingly, given the embarrassment caused to the faculty, the library acquired at the time. Though politically sensitive, the acquisition of a medal was now in itself a surprising thing for the faculty of, to have considered, as it already had a substantial numismatic collection. If the medal was given as a way to test the faculty's support for the Jacobite cause, it reinforces the faculty's role as a leading institution in Scottish society and the weight its public support would have given to the validity of the Stuart cause. The presentation of the medal, the subsequent trial of James Dundas, eldest son of Lord Arniston, for agreeing to accept it, and the Whigs' wider mistrust of the ministry that saw Sir David Dalrymple replaced as Lord Advocate, must have had a profound impact on the faculty's attitude to collecting material that promoted the Jacobite cause. In the argument over whether the medal was merely an object of historical interest, or rather something that might offend Queen Anne and the government and give legitimacy to the Stuarts, the latter thought prevailed and so may have influenced the faculty's views on collecting similar material in print. The faculty's library was directed by curators appointed from its own membership who made decisions about what was acquired. A keeper of the library from 1702 to 1728 was John Spottiswood, whose political views John Cairns has described as enigmatic, though there are possible hints of Jacobite sympathies. Spottiswood spent much of his time teaching law, and the day-to-day -day management of the library was left to the Jacobite librarian, printer, and Latin grammarian, Thomas Ruddiman. In spite of his Jacobitism, it's hard to see that Ruddiman ever let his allegiance get in the way of his career, despite the controversy over his criticism of George Buchanan's anti-monarchical views and the Jacobitism of the Caledonian Mercury. Rutherman came from Banffshire, and after a fortuitous meeting with another Jacobite intellectual, Archibald Pitcairn, came to Edinburgh where he began his employment with the Advocates Library in 1700. Though he would not be promoted to keeper of the library until 1730, his usefulness to the faculty meant that he undertook work beyond his position as an underkeeper, though that would not necessarily extend to getting his own publications into the library's collections. Along with close links, to both the library and Rutherman was the bookseller and printer Robert Freeburn, who, unlike Rutherman, was fully active in the rising of 1715, leaving Edinburgh to establish the Jacobite press at Perth. In the early years of the 18th century, Freeburn was by some margin the leading supplier of books to the Advocates' Library. Between April 1703 and December 1713, the faculty's accounts record over £3,600 Scots paid to Freeburn for books. The last payment to Freeburn before the outbreak of the 1715 rising was for £17, 16 shillings and 6 pence sterling, which is, he acknowledges receipt of on the 4th of August that year. In his account of Freeburn, published in the Scottish Historical View in 1918, the Reverend W. J. Cooper suggests Freeburn was involved in the attempt to seize Edinburgh Castle on the 8th of September. But as recorded by John Ray's History of the Late Rebellion, he was still in Edinburgh to print the manifesto and declaration by the noblemen, gentlemen and others who dutifully appear at this time in asserting the undoubted right of their lawful sovereign James VIII, the text of which was sent by Marr a few days after the raising of the standard on the 6th. Considering he was already under the government's eye, one wonders if Freeburn had nerves steady enough to keep him at work in the city and if the manifesto could really have been printed at Edinburgh perhaps a week or so after the attempt on the castle.
Following Freeburn's subsequent exile, it's not until January 1728 that the faculty is again buying books from him. Freeburn's press at Perth, the first to be set up in the city, provides an illustration of the Advocates' Library not collecting material relating to the 1715 Rising as it happened. Of the 21 works printed by Freeburn at Press, listed by the ESTC, which also includes the just mes mentioned manifesto, the Advocates' Library acquired just two. The first of these, His Majesty's Most Gracious Declaration, a reprinting of the declaration given at Commercy on the 25th of October, is bound with 194 other items, mostly single sheets or publications of a few pages and dated between 1679 and 1716. One of them being the verses on the most noble Lord Kenmure humbly offered to his eternal memory in praise of the executed, sorry, inter, pardon me, offered in praise of his eternal memory in praise of the executed nobleman. The second is the miserable state of Scotland, the union briefly represented is bound with 14 other items dated between 1704 and 1733. You can see that this copy didn't come hot from the press to the library. It's been folded and judging from the accumulation of dirt and the tears to the paper was stored that way for some time before being flattened out and bound up. To give the faculty the benefit of the doubt, it's likely these were printed in limited numbers and were read and quickly discarded so as not to have been found in possession of treasonous material which would naturally make them very difficult to collect. This is supported by the number of copies extant today, and some are known only from single surviving copies. From reference to the ESTC, holdings range from one to seven copies per title, and there's an average of just over three holdings for each work. When the Advocates Library received pamphlets, they would be bundled together and sent for binding. So it's fair to assume that items in the same volume or in volumes close by required at more or less the same time. The two titles from Freeburn's Press that the Advocates Library did acquire are now placed in what is known as Pamphlet Series 1. But this doesn't give a clear indication of just when they were accessioned, as this series was, I think, created sometime later in the 18th century by moving pamphlet volumes from other shelf marks. It's also necessary to consider that a volume of pamphlets such as the one under consideration here could have come from a contemporary individual, and so it could be that the Advocates Library only acquired the Freeburn items through the coincidence of their already being bound up with other pamphlets. Subsequent binding work by the Advocates or National Library means that such provenance can no longer be ascertained from the volume. Thanks to the 1710 Copyright Act, and Thomas Ruddiman's recording of the books and pamphlets arriving at the library via Stationers Hall in London, we can see the titles the library acquired by legal deposit. And interestingly, there's a notable gap in acquisitions during 1715. Ruddiman records a list, a list of 26 titles received on 29th of May 1714, and the next list is dated the 4th of April 1716. The 1716 list includes several items printed in London in 1715 referencing the Rising, including sermons and Sir Richard Steele's publication exposing the duplicity of the Earl of Mar. It can be seen that of the four marked here, only two ended up in the same pamphlet volume, further highlighting that it's not straightforward to give reliable accession dates just before items are now, just because items are now to be found in the same volume. I'm noticing that the highlighting you put on this hasn't come through on the slide now, but um, yeah, some of these works here are also to be seen here, and then you see that they're not bound sequentially, they, they can be spread around over different volumes. The relative ease and of course legality by which such material could be acquired meant that the library's holdings were always going to favour pro-government publications, which in any case were produced in much greater numbers. Returning to the two Freeburn publications, we need to ask how did such works come into the library? Certainly not through Stationers Hall and the Copyright Act, but I've seen nothing in the faculty records to say how or when they were acquired. 
I can only speculate that they were passed to the library by individuals who took the view that such works would be of interest to posterity, or, as just mentioned, that they were part of collections already put together by others. The Miserable State of Scotland is recorded in the 1742 printed catalogue of the library, so it had been acquired at some point by then, but I've not been able to find the declaration in the same catalogue. The appearance of the Miserable State of Scotland in the 1742 catalogue shows that by this time the faculty were prepared to publicly acknowledge, publicly acknowledge their ownership of pro-Jacobite material. Briefly broadening this survey just a little, works that were only critical of the union of the parliaments are not so difficult to find as what appear to be contemporary acquisitions. An example of a work not overtly political but still carrying an easily readable Jacobite message is Alan Ramsey's The Gentle Shepherd, which the Advocates Library didn't acquire a copy of until publication of the Files Press edition of 1788. As for his poems, a two-volume set of the 1721 Edinburgh edition printed by Thomas Ruderman was not acquired until sometime between 1788 and 1807, and a London 1800 edition was acquired, presumably by legal deposit, just after publication. Um, it could be argued that generally the faculty did not show much interest in collecting works of drama and poetry, but a number of editions of Ramsey's Pastoral had been printed by the mid-18th century, many of them printed in Edinburgh, and it cannot be from want of opportunity that these works were not acquired. Though the Advocates Library had publicly presented a desire to collect history, evidence suggests this should be read as history that was safely in the past rather than as a desire to acquire material of a politically dangerous nature as it was printed, however much use it may be to future historians. Despite the Jacobitism of its librarian and his connections to Freeburn, the faculty was unwilling or unable to collect contemporary pro-Jacobite material. Like the Select Society that first met in the Advocates Library in 1754 and maintained a rule that Jacobitism was a prohibited subject of debate, so the faculty itself appears to have avoided courting any similar controversy. The politically sensitive nature of collecting the full range of contemporary history in the first half of the 18th century meant that the library's collections lacked the full spectrum of material, a deficiency that would not be significantly addressed until the 20th century formation of the National Library. Thank you. I could get right into it. Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk about my work as a research assistant on the Lion and Morning project. Um, I should note that this has built on George's work, um, earlier research that I took over from earlier this year, and so in effect, kind of presenting combined efforts. Um, so the main aim of this research was to discover the location of the other materials that Forbes used to write the Lion and Morning. So if you read the line, Forbes copied out letters and interviews that built up this narrative. Um, but he also refers to a lot of original records as existing among my papers, uh, kind of somewhere off in an office, probably down in Leith. Um, so the aim here was to discover where these papers are now and possibly what other records he possessed. Um, a secondary aim of this, uh, which has been slightly hampered by the limited access to National Records Scotland, but it wants to boo, <laughs> um, uh, has been to find other copies of the items that Forbes included in The Lion and Morning. So things like a different version of the same account of battle or poems, things like that. Um, so today, yeah, I'm really going to focus on that main aim, however, and give you an overview of the trail of Forbes' papers. Uh, really what this will be is looking at two routes for where the papers went after Bishop Forbes died in 1775 and where we can find those records today. I'll start with the best known accounts um, of the passage of the line in morning to Sir Henry Stuart of Allenton. Um, and on to Robert Chambers, not to the National Library of Scotland. Um, and the second uh, section of this talk will look at the roots of the papers through the Cheney family and from there their dispersal. Right. So the established narrative is that Forbes died in 1775, um, and when he died, the line of mourning passed to his wife, wife Rachel Houston. Rachel Houston then sold the line of mourning to Sir Henry Stuart of Allenton in 1806. Uh, Sir Henry was a Lanarkshire aristocrat and agricultural improver with an interest in Scottish history, and he initially sought to use the Lion and Morning for his history of the 1745 Jacobite Rising. Uh, but he later sold uh, volumes to Robert Chambers 
sometime between 1831 and 1834. Robert Chambers there. Uh, Robert Chambers was a publisher and author, and he published sections of Lion and Morning in 1734 in his Jacobite memoirs of the Rebellion of 1745, and he later added sections of this to his History of the Rebellion in Scotland in 1745-1746, uh, the last edition of which was published in 1869. Uh, in 1871, as we've heard, Chambers uh, donated the line of mourning to the Advocates Library. Uh, the, collection of the, ad the collections of the Advocates Library and the National Library of Scotland were merged in 1925, leading to the line of mourning's present-day location in the National Library. Right, so this route from the Forbes family to Sir Henry, um, and then on to Robert Chambers, initially seems to be the most natural place uh, to find Bishop Forbes' papers as we have people who are collecting a variety of Jacobite documents to publish their own histories of the Risings, and they'd be interested in both the completed line of mourning and also other papers surrounding that. Um, so to an extent, this is accurate. Um, and it appears that when Sir Henry acquired the line of mourning, he acquired some of the associated records that were used by Forbes. Right, uh, these records were not donated by Robert Chambers along with the line of mourning. Um, in 1871, but are instead found in the collection of Jacobite papers donated to the Advocates Library in 1926 by his wonderfully named son, Charles Edward Stuart Chambers. Um, Charles Chambers appears to have inherited the entire library from his father, Robert Chambers, and in an 1886 catalogue of his library, he describes his possession of Sir Henry Stuart's collection of Jacobite papers, which includes the quite vaguely titled Manuscripts of Bishop Forbes. Uh, in 1926, when Charles Chambers donated these papers to the Advocates Library, he described them as a portion of the collection of Jacobite papers formed by Henry Stuart Valentin, and he noted that it's probable that many of these papers belonged to Bishop Forbes and were supplementary to the more important manuscript. That's that list there. Um, more important manuscript, that is, say, the line in mourning. Um, so there's an immediate problem here in what in Chambers' donation in 1926 was only a portion of Allenson's Jacobite papers, which indicates that there were others, uh, possibly some of Forbes's. Uh, possibly not. Uh, putting that to one side, this is sounding very promising and exactly like the sort of cache of papers that this project set out to find. Um, right, so let's take a look at what those papers are. Here we see the discharges and charges and discharges of Murray Brawson, uh, which is written in Forbes' handwriting, this one over here. Um, and, um, and the records donated in 1926 also include some Jack White poems collected by Forbes and a few other documents that he seems to have collected and annotated. So, don't really know. I'll give you a second to take a look at that. Um, so, clearly, this is from the collection that Forbes used to write the line in mourning. Okay. Right, well, we can't celebrate too much as this collection has quite a few issues. Uh, the problem with this is that many of the records donated in 1926 were added to by both Sir Henry Stuart of Allenton and by Robert Chambers, and they're often mixed in together. So to take an interesting example, uh, Sir Henry corresponded with a number of people, um, number of people with knowledge of the 1745 rising, such as John MacDonald, uh, who was the last surviving son of Flora MacDonald. Um, so we can see that in that photo there. Um, right, so he's clearly following in Forbes' footsteps, uh, doing a similar sort of process of uh, information gathering. Uh, Robert Chambers did a similar thing and also added records to the collection, uh, such as a sketch of the later life of Flora MacDonald, which was supplied by her granddaughter. Um, so adding that extra degree of separation as time goes on. Um, Robert Chambers even attached a piece of red velvet from Prince Charles's sword to the Lion of Mourning itself. So clearly this 1926 donation is a hybrid collection built up by Forbes, Henry, Robert Chambers. Um, there are a couple of other big problems with the 1926 donation. Firstly, there are loads of records that could have been collected by any of the three men, but don't bear any, of the, any signs of when they were necessarily created or added. Uh, because of this, it's impossible to say, for instance, that 50 records are from Forbes, 40 records from Allenton, 100 records from Chambers. Um, and it's notable that quite a few records from the 17th century and refers to kind of wider subjects in Scottish history, which we know that Forbes was also interested in, as were Allenton and Chambers. Um, another big problem with this collection is that it is not itself very big. It's not the, and it doesn't include all the items that Forbes says were in his papers. This clearly isn't the, the entirety of it. So the collection is a few hundred items bound in three volumes, um, but clearly if we're being very generous and assuming that the vast majority of these records were Forbes's, um, it still isn't the sort of collection that would have been used to make Line and Morning, which is ten volumes and you know, pretty substantial. 
Um, okay, so we have this second route. So where are the other papers? Uh, for this, we have to go all the way back to when Forbes died in 1775 and to look at where his papers went then. Right, so this is what we'll call the Cheney route, the second route. This line of inquiry stems from the 1836 document left by Jean, Jean Rind, uh, formerly Jean Cheney, who argued that Sir Henry's story that he had bought the records from Rachel Houston in 1806 was actually false. Um, in her description, Rind stated that with regard to the line, he, Sir Henry Stuart Valentin, is possibly the most notorious liar, for he never bought it from Mrs. Forbes, because she died about a fortnight after her husband, but the whole of the bishop's papers were packed up, I think in his presence, before he died. So certainly this point seems, this first point seems to be accurate, and there's an obituary for Rachel Houston in January 1776, printed in the Scots Magazine. Mine continues, and I quote, uh, the Reverend George Cheney, my father, was his, Bishop Forbes, um, his sole executor, and that the papers were sent to him in Stirling in 1775. After this, George Cheney refused to lend the documents to anyone, noting that Forbes himself had not intended for them to be published. So in this narrative, the papers passed from, to the Cheney family in 1775, rather than remaining with Forbes' wife. Um, certainly it seems that George Cheney executed Forbes' will, and would thus have access to his papers at his death. This fact makes to Ryan's second claim quite intriguing. Ryan stated that in March 1783, after George Cheney had died, Sir Henry Stuart Valentin sought out her brother and begged that he, and I quote, lend of these papers of Bishop Forbes, which had been that very said line in mourning, and that he would take uh, great care of them. Jean Ryan's brother was Hugh James Cheney, who was an Episcopal clergyman in Stirling. So while not detailing the extent of this transaction, Ryan states that Hugh Cheney sent what Stuart wanted, and this was how um, Stuart came into possession of the line in mourning. Given that a portion of Forbes' documents uh, out with the line in mourning are in this 1926 donation by, by Charles Chambers, it seems quite clear that Hugh Cheney sent more than just the, the um, 10, 10 uh, volumes of the line in mourning, but that he also sent along some of Forbes' papers. Um, this would have included involved an element of selection, and suggests that while some of Forbes's papers were sent to Sir Henry, some were also retained by the Cheneys. So this is the slightly other route, <laughs> slightly changed route. Um, right, so what are the records retained by the Cheneys? Uh, in the National Records of Scotland, um, there's a collection of Forbes's manuscripts sent by Isabella Cheney to the Episcopal Bishop of Edinburgh in 1886. This is that letter. Uh, in this letter, Isabella Cheney notes, How the book came, into my, came to be in the possession of my family, I know not. My grandfather was the Reverend George Cheney, occasionally mentioned by the bishop, Bishop Forbes. Right, so this seems to indicate that some of the papers went from, the for, from Forbes to George Cheney to his son Hugh, and from Hugh to Isabella, and then from Isabella to the Bishop of Edinburgh. So what's in this collection? Well, for the most part, these are papers relating to... Christianity. I mean, Forbes was, after all, a Scottish Episcopal bishop. Um, I think that it's really important to remember that this was what Forbes was, first and foremost, but that this was totally intertwined with his Jacobitism. This is really evident in the papers that were donated by Isabella Cheney, where we see documents like those prayers up on the screen. Um, right, but if we look on to the next slide, we see that Forbes also included things like the charity he gave out to Jacobites in the wake of the 1745 rising. Significantly also, we see that there are multiple references within these sorts of documents to the Lion in Mourning um, in this collection. So clearly we have a collection of primarily religious documents that Forbes saw as interacting with his record of the Jacobite rising. So basically it seems that pretty much all of Forbes' papers passed to the Cheney family, um, that some were then given to Sir Henry, along with the line in mourning, and then some of the more religious papers that included quite a lot of Jacobite elements were then retained by the Cheneys. Um, given that Forbes's religious papers appear in a load of archives, uh, from the National Library of Scotland, the National Records of Scotland, the Bodleian Library, I think also the Mount Stewart archive in Butte, um, it seems quite plausible that Hugh Cheney, who was an Episcopal clergyman, donated or lent these papers out to a variety of people. They were sold and widely distributed. And what's important to note about these collections, however, is that the overlap between religious and Jacobite records comes up again and again and again in Forbes' manuscripts. Uh, those of us who were at the, event, at the event at the NLS yesterday would have seen an annotated copy of the Bishops of Scotland, where Forbes copies out letters about Jacobite exiles in Prussia that have very little to do with the Bishops of Scotland directly. 
Uh, in the Bodleian Library also, there are papers written by Forbes that go into the Jacobite Rising in 1715, 1719, and he cites a letter from Rob Roy McGregor from 1719. Um, that's this sort of stuff. Right. Uh, in particular, in the National Record of Scotland, um, we see the extent of this overlap in a few documents. Here we see a song about Prince Charles and a poem that Forbes composed about Jacobite exiles. for a second. Um, okay. Right. Um, so let's get some conclusions from this. Um, so really what this leads is, is to the view that a discrete body of Forbes's Jacobite papers probably didn't ever exist. Um, and that instead they were simply his papers. And that these papers passed to the Cheney family in 1775 and began to be divided as early as the 1780s. We know that some of the original records that Forbes used to make the Lion and Morning were sent to, head to Sir Henry Stuart Valentin, along with the Lion and Morning itself, and that these then came into possession of the Chambers family, and from then, the National Library of Scotland today. Uh, for the other papers, I have to confess, I don't entirely know where they are. Uh, clearly, there was a major overlap between religious and Jacobite records, and thus we can find some of these papers, as here, um, that were used to write the Lion and Morning within the religious collections. Um, however, I've yet to come across a large cache of documents of the kind that we really anticipated when we started this project. And I'd posit that many of the records have since been scattered since the passing of Hugh Cheney himself, uh, since passing to Hugh Cheney in 1781, and that many have probably been destroyed, while others will have found their ways into various antiquarian collections and such. So if anyone's ever come across any, please let me know. Thank you. Thanks. Just finally, um, here is Forbes writing about Quebec, and I thought it would be quite interesting for the uh, Canadian attendees. Uh, Copying yeah. it out of the Caledonian Mercury. Yeah. The first yeah. section of this yeah. uh, presentation, you heard from the, as, from the team of the National Library of Scotland, an Edinburgh-based team. So we're switching over the Atlantic to the SFU-based team, and just as a... It, um, a reminder, our goals were to look at, uh, to employ qualitative and quantitative digital humanities methodologies, to look at the ma manuscript, The Line of Mourning, and to mobilize um, those findings. So both through the website that people will use to interact with the manuscript, and also will be, will be featuring spotlights of particular individuals from The Line in Mourning manuscript, particularly female, laboring class and Gaelic speaking individuals. So today I'm, I'm going to just introduce our panelists to you and we'll move again as we did before seamlessly from one to the other. Um, I will be starting off and uh, telling you a little bit about the project itself and focusing on the conceptual aspects of digital humanities research that we're doing. Um, we'll be hearing next from Joey Takeda, who is really the mastermind behind all of the digital humanities work that, uh, that, that we are so privileged to have him working on the team. Um, Joey is a user, -face inter in, a user interface developer with the Digital Humanities um, Innovation Lab at Simon Fraser University. He's worked as a programmer for a number of DH projects, including the map of early modern London, landscapes of injustice, linked early modern drama online, and the Winifred Eaton archive. He recently completed his MA in English um, from the University of British Columbia, where his research focused on indigenous and diaspora literature, textual and editorial approaches, queer theory, and eco-criticism. So he will be talking to us about an exact and faithful copy encoding, transcribing, and using the digital line in morning. And we're also, uh, we'll have four of our research assistants who will be presenting some of the research we're, we're doing right now. And you'll be hearing from Jasmine Bojakli, who recently um, completed her MA in English at McGill University last year. She's currently working on her PhD in English at Simon Fraser. Her research focuses on the representation of the 18th century bod in literature and other media. And she will be focusing on recovering the voices of women in the lion and mourning. 
You'll also be hearing from Taylor Breckles, who will be talking about transcribing The Lion in Mourning. And Taylor is currently pursuing her MA in English at SFU. Her research interests include indigenous studies, media history, humor studies, and sociolinguistics. And she was awarded a David and Mary Macquarie Graduate Fellowship in Scottish Studies in 2021 to 2022. Um, You'll be hearing from Juliana Wager, um, and she is, will be talking about Forgotten Jacobites, Anne Leith and Anne McKay. And Juliana has recently completed her BA at Simon Fraser uh, in Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies and English. She is currently working towards the, her MA in English. Her research interests include 18th century Scottish literature, women's literature, and Scottish women's travel writing. Um, and I'm sure. Uh, um, we'll also hear, hear from Sean Irani, uh, who will be speaking about Ned Burke and Mrs. Robertson. And Shauna is currently pursuing her MA at Simon Fraser. Her research interests include trauma studies, feminist spatial theory, and print culture studies. She also has an interest in 19th, 18th and 19th century advertisement in the form of handbills and trade cards informed by her own experience as a copywriter in the world of advertising. Mm -hmm. All right, I also wanted to acknowledge the other team members, um, Emma Trotter, who is uh, working with us now, and previous uh, research assistants on the project, Alyssa Bridgman and Caitlin McInnes. And it is certainly a project that needs a lot of bodies and, and feet on the ground working with it. So we're very privileged to have a wonderful team of people who are working on the qualitative and quantitative analysis. All right, so as promised, I want to focus basically on the implications of bringing a digital humanities perspective to bear on the line in mourning. Why do this in the first place? And what did we learn by doing this uh, digital humanities work? But I want to begin by taking you back to what for me was that moment, the Eureka moment back in December 2019, when I was making a, uh, a research trip to the National Library of Scotland for my recent book. I had quoted the line in mourning, but like so many other scholars, I had quoted the Peyton printed edition. And as somebody who works with media, I felt an obligation to go back and look at the original source. And so I um, requested the Lion Morning manuscripts and took them back to my desk. And um, instead of seeing the kind of text that I expected to see, what I was led to believe by the printed version, uh, I saw what was an embodied impression of a single individual who had spent many hours transcribing a number of documents, having conversations with people, and utilizing whatever methods he could in order to write down um, the history that he knew very well would be forgotten. So he is a self-appointed witness and a mediator. And I realized that although the Peyton printed edition is extremely useful and I'm very grateful to what the Scottish His History Society did in printing that out, uh, making it available, I realized that it completely misses the embodied context of what was a labor intensive process by one man. So you can see just visually the kinds of differences of the impressions of the body, the flow of the pen. Um, there are even moments where Forbes really gives us a larger handwriting or smaller handwriting. It really does capture the moment in which he's writing and <clears throat> something print can never do, of course. There were 2,148 pages of his handwriting. And this is then a deliberate lieu de memoir in Pierre Nogas' term. He's trying to bring this together. And as he says in volume four, I have a great anxiety to make the collection as complete and exact as possible for the instruction of future ages in a piece of history, the most remarkable and interesting that ever happened in any age or country. It's a wonderful quotation. Um, 
a deliberate construction of that mood and memoir. So it really became my mission, as I said earlier, to learn more about the manuscript, to share this manuscript, to bring a multidisciplinary group of scholars together, um, and as well to be able to digitize it and to do the kinds of work with the manuscript that would be impossible for any one person to do on, on their own. We are employing qualitative and quantitative analysis methodologies, and I just want to also emphasize the dialectical nature of those. So by employing these methodologies, we learn more about the manuscript and we bring that to bear on back to the methodologies. It's not like an imposition of one thing onto the other. It's very much this, this uh, dialectical process that happens. So we chose to follow the text encoding initiative route, which is a standard way of representing and analyzing literary texts. And we went forward by creating separate TI files for each of the 639 items that are named by Forbes. We also scraped metadata from them. So we, we included information in those files about the item, uh, what people are mentioned, what places are mentioned, what media are mentioned, and what objects are mentioned. So each one of those individual items has that information. And we merged that as well with doing separate person fi files, separate files for people, places, and organization where we could go into more detail so we could link those to our TI encoded manuscript. This uh, is the stage where we're at now of transcription using a transcribing software, handwriting recognition software, and also obviously doing quite a lot by hand. And uh, Taylor will be talking about that in a little bit more detail in a minute. So what we have come up with then is this text encoded uh, TI um, representation of the text plus the files, and we will be using this and making this available for scholars. Now, what are the implications of doing that? That sounds like all the technical material of it. Uh, what are the implications? Why, do we, are, why are we using these digital humanities tools? And what do we hope to get out of this? Well, I, I just want to put out to start with that, um, as I suggested, the manuscript is so huge, it's so rich, and what we're able to do by employing digital tools is really to make it possible with relative ease and speed, as Ruth Anner et al. suggest, to measure the relationships between many entities in multiple ways, allowing a rich multidimensional reading of complex systems never possible before. So while we have our own ideas about what we're searching for, we also want to make this a tool that is usable for other people who are asking research questions that we don't have at this moment, but we hope that will be generated. And what I want to just briefly uh, indicate are three areas in which employing digital tools with the line and morning help us uh, see the manuscript from a different perspective. And I'd like to suggest, first of all, that by using these tools, we understand in a very different kind of way the intermedial nature of the manuscript. So we are using these digital tools that makes a, make us aware of the, the mediality of the manuscript. Second, that by using digital tools, we are also recognizing this manuscript form as a contemporary form of information technology. So by using forms of information technology, we are basically seeing parallels in what Forbes is doing. And then finally, I want to suggest that using these digital tools enables us to better identify and analyze the many forms of networks that are represented in the text. So um, this is just a, a brief indication then of some of these concepts. Happy to go into this a little bit more in detail uh, in questions or just in conversations later. Um, let's start by looking at how bringing digital tools to the line in morning allows us to see the intermediality of it. 
the items that we have separate files for have all been identified by Forbes as separate items. They're listed in the tables of contents at the back of each volume. And this was the material that Stuart of Allenton used in order to create his volume, which is called volume 11 now, which is also in the National Library of Scotland. So we started out with an understanding that what we would be able to do was to divide these items generically to find those accounts, those items that were accounts, narratives, those items that were conversations, those that were letters, those that were poems and songs, and those that were miscellaneous. And it seemed pretty straightforward when we were first working on this. What we soon realized, however, was that each one of those items represents in itself a network of mediations. And I'll just give you a couple of brief examples. So um, Forbes conducted interviews with informants. He extracted that information and then he often wrote that down. So that's one way that he gathered his information. Um, but that's not always the pattern he followed. So at times, instead of copying down the statements of witnesses, Forbes obtained copies of narratives beforehand and then followed up on the details upon meeting those individuals in person. For example, on Monday afternoon, December 28, 1747, he indicates he talked with Captain Alexander MacDonald, um, and that's Alistair, McVester, Alistair, uh, who, the Gallic poet, who visited me in my own room and favored me with a journal of several sheets. And Forbes notes that these sheets were in his own handwriting, in the handwriting of young Glen Ranald, and in the handwriting of MacDonald of Glen Allerdale. So what interested us is the fact that he is using this, uh, this account and talking to MacDonald about that and then commenting on this. So it becomes multimediated in the process of his creating the single item. Forbes next day went through the whole journal with the captain, both to prevent my making any mistakes in transcribing of it, and also to have his observations upon some parts to render them more plain and intelligible to those who are strangers, either to the subject matter or to the highlands of Scotland, and to have his additions to other parts. So there's again another layer of mediation that's happening here as he's going over the whole journal with the captain. He also gives the captain other journals of other people and asks for his comments on those and again, again makes comments about those comments. So what we found um, was that this manuscript is really a medial interface. It is something whose meaning is generated by and in inter, multi, and transmedial constellations and cross-medial references. And by exploring it through these digital tools, we were able, we're, we're able to represent that. We're also able to understand that mediality. The second thing that has become apparent to us through using digital tools is in some ways how similar the digital platform is to the manuscript platform that Forbes is using as a contemporary form of information technology. So in particular, Forbes uses this manuscript for its organizational um, affordances, its adaptability, and its flexibility. And again, just to give you a couple of brief examples, um, this is from um, the beginning of the manuscript where Forbes is giving us a letter from Robert Lyon to his mother and sisters. And Forbes originally omitted a paragraph from the letter which implied a romantic intimacy with Miss Stuart Rose. However, he later includes a note on the back cover, or the front cover, sorry, indicating finding that Mr. Lyon's own relations and Miss Stuart Rose made no secret of the mutual affection that had been between the young lady and her departed friend, I obtained a true copy of the paragraph and transcribed it above. He includes an asterisk then to mark the place where the footnote 
the, uh, the amended paragraph is and says here the omitted paragraph should follow. So footnotes allow Forbes to be more flexible in what he includes when he includes it. We can see here on this slide um, uh, an, an entry for Saturday, January 23rd, 1748, when Captain Donald Roy MacDonald and Miss Flora MacDonald dined with my Lady Bruce in her house at the Citadel of Leith. So here Forbes includes a footnote that actually spreads over the bottom of three pages in which he remarks, as truth is my only aim in my making this collection, I so gladly embrace every opportunity of correcting any mistake in the accounts I receive or any error I myself may happen to commit in the marginal notes. So the marginal notes became a way, become a way of constantly changing, altering, um, updating the information. The marginal notes also allow Forbes to include his own uh, uh, his own thoughts and his own assessments. So, for example, here he says, Donald McLeod is much more to be depended on than Ned Burke in the account of things because Ned can neither write nor read and was nearly 30 years of age before he could speak one word of English. So that's Forbes assessing the two accounts of Donald McLeod and um, of Ned Burke. We see then with the digital humanity tools, it really highlights the way this manuscript itself is a contemporary form of information technology. It is dynamic and it is evolving. Third, using digital technology tools also allows us to identify and analyze the many forms of networks that are represented in the text. And again, I'll just quote from Ruth Annert et al. from the digital turn, um, the network turn, digital humanities has proven to be an effective tool for understanding metric data on a very large scale. A seemingly infinite number of calculations can be run on the resulting network to filter and parse that large scale data, giving a more nuanced understanding of both the local and the global. In particular, by using these digital tools, we'll be able to extract and analyze more granular data. So we'll be able to tell who mentioned whom in narratives and follow that thread through. We'll be able to track who gathered together in the Jacobite cause, where and how often. We'll be able to track to whom Forbes gave, read out his accounts. And we'll also be able to track who wrote to whom, by whom and through whom, uh, through which means those letters were conveyed. Again, just to give you a couple of examples of the kinds of data that we are tracking here, this is from um, October 22nd, Forbes notes, I delivered the original of the preceding letter to Robert Chesser, staymaker in Edinburgh, to be by him carefully transmitted to James Bain, Taylor in the Strand. So those are network connections that we'll be able to map out of individuals that I think otherwise would not occur or be, be highlighted, it wouldn't be part of the process. Similarly, so, much, so many of these items that Forbes collects are read out to the invited guests. So it's really a question of Forbes creating new networks in the present as well. We have here, for example, he notes, Witnesses, Richard Seaman, Baxter and Leith, John Hay, periwig maker in Edinburgh, Mrs. Betty Seaman and Mrs. Ellie Kendall. Again, these are individuals who are not, don't figure uh, largely in the, uh, the research up to this point. So this new focus, these new digital methodologies allow us to bring out individual voices and collective voices, different collective voices that haven't been heard before. In our project, we're particularly focusing on women, Gaelic speakers, and lower ranking individuals, the ubiquitous servants everywhere who seem to be a little bit like the red shirts in Star Trek. They uh, often don't make it through. Again, being able to employ these network, these digital tools, we are turning to the network to understand old networks, new networks, using new networks to understand old networks. And just two more uh, items about doing this digital humanities analysis quickly. This digital humanities analysis also encourages a networked interdisciplinary approach to scholarship, um, which is 
the point of bringing you all here, and I'm just thrilled everybody is here being part of this new network. And I think it also encourages a decolonizing approach to research. We are involving and valuing different skill sets. Um, and just to quote my collaborator, one of our research uh, team, Joey, over there, um, these are opportunities for real collaborations for research assistants as well. RAs and others become full collaborators, complementing and sometimes superseding the project leader's expertise. And let me tell you, my RAs all supersede my expertise in coding. So um, it's a humbling experience, I have to say. So, um, so that's, a, that's a perspective on the why we're doing this. I want to hand things over to Joey to talk a little bit more about the technical details of what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as Leith mentioned, um, I'm going to kind of talk about the technical details and also show kind of some features of the website as well as, as it kind of currently stands. Um, but to begin, I kind of uh, um, I want to talk about and, and to call attention to uh, Forbes' sort of remarkable editorial practice, um, which has served as kind of the inspiration for this title, um, which is derived from a phrase that appears frequently uh, throughout the line in the morning. Uh, Forbes often notes that he's providing a true, faithful, uh, and exact transcription of what he's doing. And you can see a few examples there of things that things are in somebody else's hand or that he's providing it faithfully uh, or truly as he possibly can. Uh, for Forbes, this often means that he's retaining spelling or formatting uh, of the original and only intervening when he finds it necessary, um, carefully and explicitly signaling his intrusions with signed annotations, uh, so not to confuse his conjectures with that of the original, um, which I learned yesterday, actually, that the, uh, when I was at the National Library of Scotland, uh, is unique to Forbes' treatment uh, for The Lion and Morning. He appears to make sort of more um, uh, sort of heavier editorial interventions in his like, books that he was just reading and annotating. Um, so what Forbes sort of produced, or often tries to produce, uh, is, could be called a diplomatic edition where like an edition of a text uh, that looks to replicate the source document as faithfully as possible. Um, we seldom have the originals to consult, as, as, uh, as we've talked about, um, so we can't obviously be uh, incredibly confident about the extent to which Forbes is doing this, but there's a mix of consistent formatting and spelling crossed with inconsistencies that suggest he is recording precisely what he sees on the page or close to. Um, and I've made uh, Forbes' assertion of exact and, and faithful into the uh, into a question, and that's not an attempt to you know call it into question. The, uh, Forbes' claim into question, um, he you know Forbes is uh, remarkably faithful uh, to the formal qualities of the source materials, um, even retaining layouts of epitaphs, etc. Um, but the reason I've taken up Forbes' phrase and why I've, I've found it sort of generative uh, and posed it as a question is because throughout our projects, that's what we've been doing. We've been asking ourselves. What are we attempting to produce or reproduce? Are we, like Forbes, carefully attending to the eccentricities of the text? Or are we just trying to harvest, normalize, and read across the many volumes, ironing out um, the textual wrinkles to see those networks woven throughout the manuscript? Um, of course, it's not that one necessarily forecloses the other, uh, but rather what we're faced with and what we continue to encounter in reading Forbes's manuscript is what uh, Julie Flanders and uh, Flotus Unitas call in their edited collection, The Shape of Data, the eternal struggle between data and models. Uh, for them, data modeling, which is a relatively modern term, uh, not only names the broad and long-standing set of activities that divide the universe of ideas in specific ways, as they say, uh, but also demands critical attention, particularly by those who engage in the fashioning and refashioning of data. Uh, as they write, uh, our models, uh, in many cases, need to rep represent not only the history of the artifact itself, but also the history of the ways in which it has been described and contextualized. In the case of Lion and Morning, I would suggest that uh, we see in this complexly mediated text a similar process of describing, collecting, and assembling that we would recognize today as data modeling. That is what we see in Forbes' attempt at constructing, analyzing, and developing his own networks of communication 
and the maneuvers he employs to organize that wealth of information uh, at his disposal um, derived from various media uh, into text is data modeling of the same order that we in the Line of Morning Project have had to grapple with uh, in our own work with the text. Um, and when we began uh, thinking through the various technical approaches to working with the Line of Morning, uh, we initially considered using a relational database for modeling these networks. Um, this was and is a perfectly reasonable choice given the initial goal of establishing networks. Relational databases excel at creating flat structures um, that allow for multiple relationships between each data point. So for instance, people can be related to a place via places of death um, and places of birth. Uh, but this kind of data structure, a flatter relational model, um, is, is also very easily visualized. So this is something where um, this is pulled from our own sort of work, but you can see this is some of the sort of data we've already compiled where um, we can see the sort of uh, uh, genres uh, in the, in the, out of those 600 and some items. Um, so this is the sort of thing that a relational database makes really quickly possible. For instance, like a bar graph or even a map uh, of the places mentioned or the places that we've found mentioned so far in the line of the morning uh, and the places that we can map. Um, ships are hard to map. Um, and these are, of course, really helpful ways of seeing the data and of understanding the text in the aggregate. Um, but these sorts of things, the map and the, uh, and the, and the graph, I'd argue are products. Um, and by that, I mean they're the representations of data that, while useful for our analysis, can't or shouldn't and can't dictate how the text is modeled, that, that it can't sort of lead our approach. Um, so the database model is one that thrives in uniformity and consistency. It relies on extensive regularization and manipulation in order to make the data fit into the kinds of relationships that we think are important. But in doing so, it tends to foreclose those oddities, the eccentricities, or the realizations that we stumble across when dealing with textual and documentary data. Uh, and these are precisely the kinds of oddities, the messiness of this mediated communication, that Forbes takes great lengths to represent with the letters containing letters and the various sort of um, that, that intermedial network that Leaf was just uh, talking about. So while we can excavate data points from the text to fashion them into relational databases, what a, data breach, a, a database approach struggles with is the representation of the depth of textual data, that is the how of that relationship. Um, so people may be related to places in all sorts of ways, not only that a letter is written by a person or sent from a place, but also that Forbes deems that important because he's annotated it or highlighted it or underlined it. Um, we know that Annalise signed her name at the end of a letter, but it's near impossible in a database to provide context to that signature, that she signed it in a mix of Latin and Borough French, for instance. So we turn to the TEI since it is the de facto model for describing text digitally. It is a robust standard that has, since the 1990s, uh, been used across the world for manifold purposes. Um, the, TI, the TI is an XML language, which means that unlike databases, it models its data within a hierarchy. Uh, a book contains chapters, which contain sections, which contain paragraphs, which contain sentences, which contain words. It is, in other words, a tree, one that follows a strict set of organizational principles. Um, and it's worth noting that the most challenging aspect of working with uh, and using XML as a data model is the problem of conflicting hierarchies where various analytical structures overlap and vie for uh, primacy. So what the TEI offers for a project then is a way to model the modeling given to us. In other words, with the TEI, we allow for an openness in the way that the text may shift and surprise us while also making explicit the interpretive structures through which the project team reads the text uh, and, as Leith notes, uh, noted, um, allows us to attend to the manuscript's own digitality, the dynamic, mediated, and ultimately sort of human frameworks that bind the text, where digitality here is sort of both like, like with hands and uh, digital. Um, so I now want to turn to a few screenshots of the website, um, which is currently in active development, to kind of show what the TEI kind of allows us to do. Um, so this is, at the moment, the home page for the site, and this is still, again, a, a prototype, so uh, it's not the prettiest. Um, <laughs> um, it has none of that aesthetic value that would go up onto the... <laughs> um, but uh, it, and it, but this, so far, this website is working for us, and it's been a sort of a, a crucial for our sort of work. Um, this is the search interface that we have at the moment. Um, raft of filters uh, that allow for searching the text as well as faceted document searches. So right now we have genre, volume, page numbers, so you can find things in a certain page range. 
Um, but as we encode more, doc encode more documents, we can add more filters. So people present in the text, uh, places present in the text, or find all letters sent from Edinburgh that mention Charles Edward Stuart between April and September of 1744, or something like that. Um, the capacity to search through these documents is facilitated by the multiple kinds of data that, are con that we uh, contain within a particular item. Um, since we modeled each item as a distinct container in XML, uh, because it all nests, the transcriptions, images, and the metadata for that document can all be bundled together and be displayed in a single interface. Um, the website provides ways to navigate the internal structure of the item, so going from page to page, uh, its arrangement within the physical volume, so previous and next buttons in the corner, uh, as well as its broader genre. Um, and uh, as in Lisa was speaking to genre a little bit earlier, but some of the work that we might even want to do later is develop an even more granular taxonomy of those genres because of that intermedial nature. Um, the metadata we have compiled uh, so far is uh, titles um, as well as pages. So we have multiple pagination schemes um, so that for an item we can go between Forbes and Peyton. So we can look at each, so you can compare the two, um, or if you find the patent easier to read. Um, be, and so beyond the broader categories of the items placed within the textual structure, um, so we provide those crosswalks. Um, it also includes information about correspondence, um, for, for instance, when it's a letter or some other item that has correspondence. Part of our challenge with working with the TI too has been trying to map things meant for other genres to a different kind of these sort of hybrid genres that that Forbes sort of crafts. Um, so uh, these are sort of vital data points again for understanding the network. And while we're still aggregating this data, we've already seen how we may be able to mobilize it um, to trace sort of correspondence networks. Um, we also have a facsim so we have a facsimile viewer as well to be able to see the pages um, and zoom in uh, and manipulate them. Um, this is sort of a custom development um, and does, uh, has fuller sort of features than what's currently possible within SFU's digital library collections. Um, so instead of mapping, uh, rather than doing the entire book and mapping items onto the pages, we instead map the pages onto the items. Um, this is particularly useful for working with items like that letter um, that have pages sort of spread out um, across, across the volumes. Um, this also allows for user interaction and manipulators so readers can zoom, rotate, and annotate the images. Um, and those, for those interested, this is built using Open Layers, which is actually a mapping platform, but it works kind of beautifully for, for images as well. And of course, in using the TEI, we're able to create nuanced and manipulatable transcriptions and additions um, of the items that are not only flexible, but also allow for rich interlinking between various types of data. Uh, this is particularly helpful for realizing Forbes' goal of densely interlinking and cross-referencing document. Since we've encoded the references as they appear, we can determine both the sort of active, i.e. this letter mentions another letter in some way and in some capacity, uh, as well as the passive mention, so this letter is mentioned by uh, something else. Um, and these are relationships that, as we've discovered, are sort of really nicely two-way established. Forbes will link one in one place and link one in another place almost um, exactly where he says he would. Um, and as well, since the TEI schema operates under the assumption that while documents are similar, they need not be exact, we have greater flexibility for accommodating particular features or for enriching or uh, our encoding without necessarily making broad claims about the text as a whole. So our model doesn't need to shift uh, to accommodate Forbes's or, or even our own eccentric practices. Um, unlike a database, which would require reshaping that entire table. Uh, if you've ever worked with an Excel spreadsheet and realized you needed something new, all of a sudden, <laughs> uh, it's not fun. Um, so here's, for instance, how we've modeled the concluding segments of the letter sent from Anne Leith. Here you can see how the boxes don't overlap, but they nest. Uh, and even though, um, even though they may be spatially on the same line, uh, the paragraph we determine, um, and this is all sort of editorial um, thinking, uh, ends at the word happiness, at which point Anne Leith begins a customary uh, epistolary closing of signing date lines. Um, and then following that closer, we have a postscript. And following that postscript, we have a nota bene from Forbes. Um, because we have encoded this in TEI, this structure, uh, while only encoded once, 
can then be represented in multiple ways. So we have, uh, for instance, a semi-diplomatic transcription, which attempts to retain many of the features of the layout. Um, but we can also provide a, something like a lightly modernized version that normalizes uh, some of the spacing, et cetera, to facilitate easier and more accessible reading. Um, here you can see that there's some little gray underlines under some of the sort of irregular spelling. Those are all tags. So at the moment, we don't do anything with them, but we could. We could regularize it. Um, as we've talked about in the project, we probably don't want to do that. We don't want to make that visible because we don't, it seems a little intrusive to be changing um, um, speech. Um, so these various kinds of additions that we can produce are, all require careful editorial decisions that must be flexible and adapted to suit our own and other researchers' needs. And it's also important that we make these editorial decisions and our own modeling of the text uh, as transparent as possible. So um, all of our encoding practices have been both encoded within the schema, which dictates the structure of the XML, as well as comprehensively documented. Um, this documentation is updated frequently, probably not as frequently as it should be, but as frequently as I, you know, as I can try and write it out and we're uh, uh, working, uh, in order to reflect the current practice of what we're doing rather than a retroactive discussion of what we did. Um, this is crucial to return to the quotation from Flanders and Unitas uh, for future researchers and readers who come to Lion in the Morning to understand how the texts in this manifestation have been described and contextualized. Uh, while unlike Forbes, our hope is to bring visibility to these documents, not to memorialize them, but just to make, really disseminate them, uh, the Digital Lion in the Morning hopes uh, that two can produce an exact and faithful rendering, not necessarily of the texts, but of the intellectual, social, and political world that has and continues to inform the volumes. Thanks. isn't going to be nearly as in-depth or as formal or as professionally delivered as those we've already heard today. It's more of a sort of personal account of what it was like working on this project. Uh, so my personal involvement with the project thus far has mostly involved transcribing and some encoding work. Um, I've been involved in quite a few interesting and unique debates that I never thought I would be a part of, such as in which contexts are ships considered to be places, um, I also have a newfound respect for how 18th century Scots were able to keep track of which Donald McDonald was which. Uh, I heavily relied on Wikipedia for this and it was still confusing. <laughs> for the sake of time, I'm just going to briefly mention my experience. Um, for, the, for the project, we use Transcribus, which Leith has already briefly mentioned. But it's a transcription software that necessitated us, there we go, uh, necessitated us to only review what had been transcribed and then edit it to be more accurate. Um, this image sort of reflects what my personal screen looked like during this process where we would have the manuscript on one side and then what transcribe is produced on the other side. As you can see, edits were necessary. <laughs> um, but I'll get into that in a minute as to what the whole process was like. Before that, I would like to share sort of one of the funnier aspects of working with Transcribus in this context, which is the tale of the mints and the butter crisis. One of my favorite stories. <laughs> it's in volume two, entry 326. Uh, I'm not sure why, but Transcribus kept auto-correcting prints to mints throughout the entirety of, um, of the narrative. This is possibly because a good portion of the excerpt has to deal with food. Um, so just kind of assumed that mints would be involved in some capacity. It wasn't. <laughs> um, so having to go back and autocorrect all, all of the sections. But it, it, it ended up being really interesting when you reached the bulk of the butter crisis on page 331, in which Ned Burke was very distraught over the idea of serving his mints butter that, quote, did not look so very clean the bread being all broke in pieces amongst the butter. The mince itself did not care, <laughs> just wanted the butter. 
However, Ned Burke resolves this crisis by remembering that there was also cake. And so he for forewent the butter altogether and presented his mints with cake instead. In a manuscript that's filled with a lot of traumatic narratives, um, this passage definitely brought some levity to the work that was going on. And it stands out to me as being one of the more sort of comedic relief elements of, of working with this manuscript. Uh, it also is a good reflection of the pros and cons of using this kind of software. <laughs> so uh, one of the cons involves the setup itself. So while reviewing Transcribus, uh, my eyes would have to continually flip back and forth between what was going on in the page and what Transcribus was delivering. Um, it was very easy to lose my place. <laughs> It necessitated a lot of rereading, having to, oh no, I've already read that part, having to skim down a lot of back and forth. Um, however, when I switched over to typing things out manually, so just looking at this and then in a blank Google Doc typing what I saw, I could transcribe more by um, sort of muscle memory than having to go back and edit the words and completely redo everything, which ended up working better, it was faster. So, and, but uh, interestingly, there was also a shift in how my mind actually processed the content of the manuscript. So it went from being more of an abstract formulation of letters and structures to being a more concrete narrative. Uh, so I was able to pay attention to what was actually going on in uh, on the pages itself, instead of just finding, you know, oh no, this is an E, this is a P, etc. Um, which ironically, is the exact opposite of what we do while we're encoding. <laughs> like Joey mentioned with all the structures where you break things down to their very fundaments. Uh, so for me, transcribing the text manually allowed me to appreciate the nuances of the manuscript, such as these things. Oh, I don't know why that arrow's down there. It's supposed to be up there. Oh, okay, just take all the arrows and shift them up about two inches. <laughs> um, but I could, I could look at the nuances, like things and variations in handwriting, uh, notations, stylistic elements, changes in font, all of this, which of course was done manually by Forbes, uh, which transcribers can't pick up on. It's not going to say, you know, this word was underlined. This is something that we as people have to notice and then record. Um, so formatting features, handwriting styles, things like this, a lot more uh, easy to appreciate while doing things manually as opposed to transcribe us. All in all, I gained a lot of respect for Forbes as a serious and dedicated social anthropologist. He clearly had a very precise method for his work and um, it has been exceptional being able to engage with this content. Thank you. So I actually changed my title at like 10 o'clock last night. Um, so it's not recovering the voices of women in the line in mourning, it's silent voices of women in the line in mourning. Um, so in the poem Swivel, commissioned by the National Library of Scotland for new treasures, Miriam Gamble uses fragments of Robert Forbes's line in mourning to focus in on instances where women, children, or animals are mentioned in the narrative. Gamble begins her poem specifically with a line from Robert Lyon's letter to his mother and sisters. My dear mother and loving sisters, I could not allow myself to leave without bidding you farewell and offering my advice. Um, as you can see, she, she really, the way she sets up her poem makes it look very fragmentary, um, which emphasizes her, uh, like what she's doing with the pulling fragments from the narratives. Um, so in beginning her poem with the very first letter in Robert Forbes's collection, which also happens to be a letter to the women in Robert Lyon's life, Gamble is setting up her poem to draw her reader's eye to those individuals we would otherwise overlook. Although difficult to see at first glance, these people, and occasionally animals, play a role in the lives of each of the individuals Forbes transmits. Like Gamble's poem, the Lion and Morning Team's project involves bringing out the voices of those who have been marginalized in the Jacobite Risings. Um, among vo the voices we are seeking to recover are those of servants and lower class individuals, Gallic speakers, and women. 
despite the masculinity subsequently associated with the Jacobite risings and the near erasure of women, uh, of the women involved in these risings in Jacobite studies, women are everywhere in Forbes's manuscript. Our project draws further attention to these women who, uh, to those women who are more well known, such as Flora MacDonald and Lady Anne Mackintosh, um, attempting to read them on their own terms, as Juliana will suggest in a moment. But it also draws attention to the roles of women who are hiding in plain sight in Forbes's Jacobite networks, such as Dame Magdalen Scott, Lady Bruce of Kinross. In a series of what we have termed spotlights, we will include women such as Lady Bruce, who hosted Forbes and other Jacobites at her home in the Citadel of Leith. Although we usually hear only tangentially about Lady Bruce in The Lion in Mourning, Forbes also includes several anecdotes that indicate her importance. One event that Forbes discloses relates the raiding of Lady Bruce's house after a Mr. George Lindsay gives information of her involvement with, Jack with Jacobites to Justice Clerk. Um, my Lady Bruce has often assured me of the truth of this discovery, and she, uh, of this discovery she had made, and that she was certain the thing had come about in the way above mentioned, for that an old friend of hers waited on the Justice Clerk, to whom he declared his being much surprised how it should come about that my lady had met with any such trouble, seeing her ladyship was an old woman, much retired from the world, and very remarkable for her polite and neighborly behavior throughout her whole life. It is not only that Lady Bruce is a woman that leads the justice to believe that she would not meet with any such trouble, but the fact that she's an old woman. In her study of writers in the 18th century, Devaney Lucer points out that uh, male and female writers experienced old age differently, stating that rich old men might expect and be granted respect and authority, uh, while for women, old age was more likely to be uh, experienced as a period of loss, both in terms of property and law, and in terms of physical de decay. The fact that the justice cannot imagine Lady Bruce to be a source of trouble merely because of her age proves the difference in uh, respect sorry, differences in respect men and women, even when in the elite classes received as they aged. It is implied here that while it is difficult to imagine a woman in Lady Bruce's position, it is even more difficult to imagine a woman of her class, respectability, and age. However, despite Justice Clerk's belief in Lady Bruce's polite and neighborly behavior, her house is still raided and in a horrifyingly intrusive manner. Her house is torn apart as the authorities search for evidence of her involvement. Uh, her correspondence is read, and yet nothing is found to incriminate her, despite the fact that Forbes has been residing in her house. Women such as Lady Bruce are able to fall under the radar, so to speak, as members of the Jacobite network Forbes, Forbes illustrates for us, simply because of their gender. But moments like the one previously mentioned are just as important to our understanding of these networks as other more well-known events. Okay, so mine is Forgotten Jacobites, Anne Leith, and Anne McKay. Um, I would now like to briefly mention four more women that we are writing spotlights on and their efforts for the Jacobites. Beginning with Anne Leith, a woman who helped keep prisoner soldiers alive and fed, risking her own health and safety for them. Here's an excerpt from The Line in Mourning that Robert Forbes copied from Anne Leith's own writing. In short, from the 17th of April until the 29th of July, thereafter, I never was two hours at a time in my own house, but while I slept, still going from prison to prison and from one great person to another, soliciting favors for the distressed. There was neither man or woman in this place would have ventured to visit their nearest relation in prison, and indeed no wonder, as there was nothing but persecuting of everybody supposed to have a good wish to that cause. As I was one day passing in the street, I was seized and carried prisoner by this Captain Ayres. Then I was narrowly searched for letters or other papers, but luckily none about me. I had no access to my relations, having forfeit their favor by my sentiments. But I found, sorry, but I found means to convey a letter to a true friend on, of our own side and not suspected. 
This friend waited upon General Husk and represented the injustice of Captain Eyre's procedure and told I was only a private widow gentlewoman and that I only visit some of my relations who were prisoners of war. Husk gave orders I should be released, but after this I was three different times taken up again, but not confined above four hours at a time. Anne Leith downplays her own experiences. She was taken prisoner four times and due to her constant efforts to provide provisions to the prisoners, her health suffered greatly. Despite her difficulties, Leith manages to note joy and success in her account, stating, I had the good fortune to see a great number of friends, relations, and the best acquaintances I had in the several places of my residence, which together with the hope I had at that time, put me in top spirits. Leith did her best to remain positive and her efforts must not be forgotten. It's also important to note that Forrest retains her spelling and punctuation, as we can see here, um, leading us to believe that this is a copy of her letter. So you can see that the spelling is not really what we would say is accurate. Um, another significant woman of the Jacobite Rising was Anne McKay, a Gaelic-speaking woman from the Isle of Skye. McKay was chosen to aid two wounded soldiers, Robert Nairn and Macdonald of Ben Finley, by bringing them supplies. McKay helped them from April 1746 to March of 1747, and by then her job turned into something much more risky. Forbes quotes Sir Francis Stewart, who was giving him the account of Anne McKay, that a plot was laid by some charitable ladies for helping Nairn to make his escape. Of this plot, the poor Highland woman, Anne McKay, was made principal manager, and indeed she managed wonderfully. For after equipping Nairn in the warmest manner he could be clothed in, she decoyed the sentry of the door of the cellar, by which means Nairn slipped out and made his escape. Unfortunately, McKay suffered the consequences of her efforts and received unspeakable punishments and torture. McKay never disclosed information about Nairn and was eventually put in the town's toll booth where she was kept for many weeks. Her story is one of courage and strength, which is similar to that of many other women that Forbes mentions, including poor Kate, who could not talk one word of English, being a native of Skye, and who generously offered herself to Miss Flora MacDonald when she could get not one that would venture to go with her when Flora was captured and sent to the prison ship in Leith as well as a nameless servant, Lass, who shows her feisty nature when asked to clean the feet of whom she thinks is a servant and is actually Charles Edward Stewart in disguise. When she asked, she exclaims, no such thing, although I wash the master's feet, I am not obliged to watch the servants. He's but a lowly country woman's son, I will not wash his feet indeed. These four women, as well as many others mentioned in the pages of the manuscript, represent a fuller account of the Jacobite Rising. The Line and Morning Project aims to do more than just write about these forgotten women but to add their voices into the narratives of Jacobite history using their words and stories that are just as important as their mayor peers. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'm going to speak about tales of trauma in the line in morning. So there's a running joke in our team, and that is, um, that no one in history has cared for Ned Burke like I do. <laughs> one of the first letters I worked on was one where Forbes detailed Ned's various escapades. In order to avoid arrest, Ned enlisted the aid of a shoemaker's wife, disguised himself, and dodged the evil schemes of one Peter MacDonald, his arch, member, uh, his arch nemesis who also happened to be a distant family member. Nevertheless, I would read about Ned's near escapes and tell the team, I just hope Ned makes it out okay. <laughs> and they would say, Shauna, <laughs> you do know which manuscript we're dealing with. <laughs> and that was just it. The line in morning isn't just a story, it is a tra traumatic account of reality. And in that sense, it can never end as a story does, but must linger on. As a manuscript of accounts, letters, and testimonies, the line in mourning is as much about memory as it is about trauma. Forbes wrote, wrote his 10 vol volume manuscript in the five years following Culloden, and yet, in the words of trauma theorist Morris Stevens, memory exists continually, inscribed in the ongoing production of a narrativized self. The muscle remembers, the space is haunted, the landscape is always scarred, always with memory a trace remains. What I'm hoping to suggest is that in compiling this manuscript, Forbes not only provides us with a historical background, but also provides us with the opportunity to trace cultural trauma. Now, while everyone remembers the men who fought and died in the Battle of Culloden, few think of the women who faced the bloody aftermath of war. 
yet Forbes includes accounts of their efforts. Women such as Mrs. McIntosh, who stood mortified as the horses strode many corpses underfoot, women like Anne McKay, who resisted inquisition, bribe and torture, and the many other women whose accounts are captured in the line in mourning. Mrs. Robertson was called a rebel bitch for helping to bury the dead, but we also hear the consequences of such an action. The country people durst not venture upon burying the dead, lest they should have been made to bear them company. Mrs. Robertson also provides a detailed account of the corpses and the faces that were so cut and mangled that they could not discern to be faces. She speaks of the 19 wounded men who were also mercilessly shot. Lady Inches also provides a full-bodied account of trauma as she describes how Lady McIntosh was taken to Inverness. She speaks of a great body of men consisting of several regiments sent upon the command to drag her away. She relates the dead beat of the drummers and the horses who trod many corpses underfoot. And most evocatively, she describes the generous-hearted Lady McIntosh, who is left behoved to have the mortification of viewing the shock exceed. Mrs. Robertson, Mrs. McIntosh and others provide a key function to Forbes. They are witnesses to trauma. And in reading the line in mourning, Forbes invites us to become secondary witnesses to trauma. The line in mourning confirms that the Battle of Scars are not only seen on the body, but they are inflicted upon the mind. The tale of war is as much about those who die during battle as those who must live through it, and then must testify what they have seen, heard, and known. The line in mourning tells us about the many plots, escapes, and avoidances of death, and yet it also attests to the endless impact on life. So on behalf of the team, I would like to thank you for giving us the opportunity to share our experiences. And at this time, I would like to ask if anyone has any questions for any of the speakers that have been up here.
Thanks, Eric. That's very fascinating work. So um, how much kind of government work that you're doing is manual work? I mean, especially collecting all the metadata, does that require research assistance going through the manuscript and identifying everyone individually? Or have you also found some other methods for searching for names, places? <laughs> Um, so yeah. we we actually do it manually, so we transcribe the work manually. We have the help of transcribers. Taylor was talking this, about this as well. So transcribers gives us like an uh, an outline of what we have to do, and then we go in manually um, and and reread everything. Uh, there were also some people who were working on the metadata before I came here. So Taylor, maybe yeah, metadata was all manual. <laughs> <laughs> so every person, every place. That's why um, discussions on our ships, places, and this kind of thing mm -hmm. were, were so crucial and, and occurred over so many different weeks trying to determine what is what, because yeah, it was, it was all manual. Mm -hmm. And did we include fictional characters, mm -hmm. as people mentioned in the narrative? So there were some very interesting discussions that mm -hmm. came up about that, but yeah, that was all. We, we had a terrific team of to do all of that. It's a lot of work and it couldn't be done by any one person. Um, one, one quick thing I'll add there is that one could use something like a natural language processing to run through the, the, the text and identify names, um, but it's only going to be so accurate um, and we would have had to transcribe it anyway in order to do that. Um, and I'm sort of a school of thought that like if you're going in there and transcribing it anyway, might as well do the work and look up the person because you now know about them and you're interested in them, rather than doing it in multiple passes, mm -hmm. making a computer do it, and then having to go through and, and get somebody else to do that research, even though you just spent you know months looking at that book. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, huge, huge shout out um, as well to uh, Alyssa Bridgman, who's not here, but who did a lot of that meta meta data collection as well. Yeah, Christine. I was just going to say, so it's it's fascinating just to hear all the you know the, such a great team effort working on all of this and pulling out these stories and these these new people. Um, I, I mean, I know from your plans with the with the network, you know, that, that there are plans to capture some of that you know, sort of traditional research, you know, in terms of papers and, and chapters yeah. and books and whatever. Yeah. Um, but have you got other ways of of sharing that information a little bit more anecdotally? The, the kind of the stories of the people you're finding. Have you, is, are, have you are you planning to give more presentations, or are you planning to do something? more with social media in that regard to kind of drive interest in this mm -hmm. amazing resource that you're creating? Do you want to um, yeah, so it's kind of all of the above. We actually um, presented at the Highland Games in British Columbia this last week, maybe? I don't remember <laughs> when. <laughs> uh, it was last week. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, so we did a presentation about female rebels of the Jacobites. So yeah, we shared stories similar to this um, with quite a big audience yeah. and standing room only. Fantastic. Yeah, it was really good. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully more presentations like that. Mm -hmm. um, Lise was talking about a podcast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so similar, similarly sharing the stories that we find because there's so many. Yeah, yeah. And we're, we're, trying to, to, we're trying to hit multiple kinds of audiences as well. So academic audiences certainly um, and not, not just um, Jacobite studies, but um, other literary studies, uh, other disciplinary studies, um, including we're also going to write papers for, um, that look at the digital aspects of the mm -hmm. project because mm -hmm. we think there's ways that yeah. the work that we're doing can also be really helpful um, in terms of people working on digital humanities as well. We've encountered quite a few <laughs> interesting mm -hmm. issues that might be helpful for other projects too. So there are multiple ways and multiple, what do they call deliverables, Christine. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just those, I mean, you know, you know, not everybody's gonna necessarily want to, to spend time, you know, like us, yeah. uh, with the manuscript, but actually, you know, those stories are really fabulous human they're stories and, and actually yeah. there's a much, much broader audience, which obviously you're, you're on top of. So that's great, yeah. Was, if you have any other ideas, ideas, please send them along. We are happy to entertain. Great. Awesome. Mm -hmm. and, and then all suggestions. Fantastic.
Um, yeah, I'm just you you mentioned um, an allusion by Robert Ford, um, in, in that he um, initially cut out uh, a reference by yeah. Yeah. Lyon to his fiance. Yeah. Um, is there any? I mean, are there other places where he was cutting things out, but? didn't subsequently put them back, so you know there were cuts uh, because it might embarrass somebody or something like that. Yeah, um, and that's an interesting question too. So there, there, there are actually two versions of Lord Ballerino's letter that he includes. One he notes is in the Lord's own handwrit, um, and I think probably what he's getting for the other one is a printed version that he's writing out from a version that was printed and circulated. And so what we will do is compare, we can do this manually compare um, and see what, what, what is being changed between the handwritten and the printed version that I presume he's writing out. And I, I mean, that, that, that to me raises also, and, and I think this was one of the things I was struck by, opening the cover and seeing what was added to with a little asterisk and thinking, well, what other ways are there that he is leaving things out, massaging data? I mean, so I think we're going into this with really an awareness that all we are getting is a level of mediation, mm -hmm. and some of which we we know about in instances like that, others of which we just don't. How much did he manipulate his witnesses? Um, there's indication in when he's talking to Donald McLeod, for example, McLeod says, oh, I really don't have a lot to say. And uh, you sort of hear Ford saying, yes, you do. I can get this amount of material from you. You have to give me this when you're doing an interview. So it's like the oral historian's nightmare of leading the witness. Um, yeah. And so we get these hints, but um, yeah, I think, I think we are definitely aware that A, there is, all of this is mediated by Ford. B, we are also another level of mediation, so we have our own gaps and, and failures and someone, you know, 20, 100 years, whatever, looking at what we're doing. We'll also be probably critical of some of the choices that we made, so we, we see ourselves as part of a, 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 a layering of mediation still. Not much to be done. No, uh, no, except to acknowledge it, and I think that's important. We're not, we're not claiming this is you know, the unmediated truth. Even with Anne Lee's letters, yeah, he does transcribe the spelling in her extremely interesting um, uh, and idiosyncratic way of spelling, so he's keeping that. But is he? When we're looking at the signature, um, yeah, he, he tries, it seems to try to make a copy of the signature, um, but with the claim there is that Anne Lee um, and there's also ways that he set it up that indicate some literacy, some understanding of epistolary conventions. Is that him or is that her? And there's the question, right? So um, we don't have anything except Forbes and Forbes' body writing out what he's already mediated that have come multimediated ways. I think just to say on the um, point about Lord Palmerino as well, where it's like if Forbes says, oh, I'm going to take this out, but then he goes back on himself almost immediately and says, well, I've since found out that the intimate relationship is mm -hmm. fine because I've yeah. heard from the source that they're okay with recording this. And then he puts it back in again. Yeah. Um, and also when you were saying about that, is he manipulating or leading witnesses in a particular way? I mean, he specifically does it in the story when he's recounting Felix and Yule's um, interactions with Boy Prince Charlie because he gives his account, uh, Felix and Yule gives his account, and then at the bottom, Forbes says, well, you know, when I spoke to him in Edinburgh Castle, it's like he actually gave more information. And what he's specifically driving at yeah. is that <clears throat> this reflects better on Bond Prince Charlie because it's like it's showing him cool under pressure um, that this was eliminated effectively from the version that, that Anil gave. And it's like, well, did, did that happen or did, did Forbes have a particular angle? I mean, I think he excuses it away by saying, well, look, um, perhaps once when you will get to a safe place, he's going to bring out his own edition, and this might be, you know, exposed in the fullness of time. But you know, it's not entirely satisfactory as a, a as an answer. 
Yeah. We also have one question um, that has come online. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, um, thanks to all the presenters for the excellent presentation. It's fascinating, and I want to learn more. A question related to coding, um, I guess, and people's names in your project. Oh, it ties into the stated aim of recovering Gallic voices from an Anglophone manuscript. Yes. Is there a possibility of tagging the names of Gales with the Gallic sorry, Gal Gales with the Gallic form of their names? Gallic names are very different from the Anglophone version. Yes, Alexander McDonald, as you know, is known as Alcare Manchester, Alcare, but also Alcare. But Donald can then be ruled out where possible and applied to those who know or seem to be Gallic speakers. Yeah, that's an absolutely great question, and we are going to be relying on your expertise and those of your Gallic colleagues as, as well. So um, that's the, our hope to do that, and certainly that's something that we considered in looking at the names. Um, so absolutely, that is that is our intention to be able to do that, but we will need to reach out to other people who are, there's no Gallic scholar on our team, unfortunately. Um, I, I presume the same approach, though, that you gave to, to Alistair's question, it will fold down the different versions that Forbes uses, either from personal testimony. I was reading just mm -hmm. some of the selections that you've given, yeah. trying to notice where they varied, and they were actually quite consistent in Forbes' own terms, but obviously, as you've seen, we're working with copies of copies in some cases. So I thought the response to Alice's question was excellent. That would also fold in the different variations and also an explanation. Um, all the Donald McDonalds, obviously, but <laughs> any of you, um, they're, they're, they're normally McDonald of somebody or, you know, McNeil of that. So that's, I would imagine, fairly easy to add to the tag, which is going to create the master entry. But that will also hoover in Forbes's variations if it's obvious it's the same. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, that sounds perfectly feasible, basically, for this question to cope with the same, the same issue, um, but also to. It would be interesting to use some of the genealogies as well, which tend to be a nineteenth-century phenomenon, and um, some people here might have experience of them as well. But there are a particular collection for the McDonalds of Glengarry of uh, Clonmacnoise in particular, and they date from the. I guess about a century after Forbes, but they tend to be presenting the oral tradition, the Shenachus that has survived until that point, until it's printed. Um, and there were a few names that leapt out. So if you're used to working yeah. with one or the other, you probably could fairly easily map on some of the people, but some of the dolls are going to remain un unreduced, <laughs> I strongly suspect. <laughs> That's a technical aspect. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. And we will absolutely be coming back to, to you and other Gallic scholars, too. You're, you're also reminding me of one of those early issues um, uh, that we encountered in thinking about setting up our questions, um, which was when we have a, a person's name um, uh, related to a place, mm -hmm. do we tag it as a person and a place, a place within a person, and we realize um, just ideologically, conceptually, the importance of uniting person and place, and mm -hmm. just how strong that is for um, Gallic speakers especially, that, that is something we were, we were struck by. Um, so yes, uh, in answer to your question, that's definitely our intention, I mean, that's what we're hoping to do. So, yeah. Thanks for that. Um, I'll just say on the technical side, there are a number of, um, a per one of the reasons why PEI is so nice and XML is so nice is that it can um, model that kind of uncertainty or model uncertainty or model temporality or model multiplicity. All of those things are really, really quite easy to do in PEI. So you can have multiple variations of names. You can have names that are uh, from this date to this date or only applying, like these people only knew or called this person by a particular name. Um, all of those things can be collected under a, a singular person's record, and then you only have to do that once. And then your instance, every instance of tagging just relates all that information back. So in, in some cases, there are arguments against that sort of approach because 
if you click on the name in the uh, context, it may give you way more information than you ever thought you'd need because it's not operating in that precise context. But on the other hand, you click the name and all of a sudden you get this wave of information that can really kind of enrich um, this person's record because you didn't realize all the all these other sort of instances. Um, so um, on a technical level, it's um, the TDI is like really well suited for kind of grapple, or like handling all of the variations of names, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is wow. Okay, um, this uh, there's never enough time. I think so. I feel like apologies here. Um, so we're, we're moving on to lunch, which is downstairs in the room immediately below here. Please feel free to uh, get lunch. There's it, it is not raining out. It is a beautiful Edinburgh day. <laughs> so please feel free to circulate amongst yourselves. We'll come back in the afternoon and. There's been a lot of presentations this morning. The afternoon we really um, will be focusing on discussions. And on the back of your program, you'll see there are some questions that we have invited you to consider. Um, he took his first degree at the University of Sheffield and his DPhil at the University of Oxford. He's taught a diverse range of institutions, uh, including the University of Hull, St. John's College, Oxford. Auburn University, Alabama, the Air War College in Montgomery, Alabama, and the University of Manchester. He retired in 2017 and is Emeritus Professor in Early Modern History at the University of Manchester, Honorary Professor of History at the University of Aberdeen, and Emeritus Professor of History at Auburn University. Um, he's written, obviously, extensively on the Jacobites and um, his latest book, The Jacobites, Britain in Europe, 1688 to 1788, was published in May 2019. We're very thrilled that you could join us here for this event. And please welcome Daniel Fitch. Thank you. I should make clear that this, um, uh, the paper I'm about to read is a sawn off uh, uh, part of the, an article that uh, Chris Watley uh, and I um, have uh, uh, jointly concocted, which will be appearing um, in parliamentary history uh, in 2023, uh, at some point in 2023. So, the leaders of underground movements dedicated to the overthrow of the existing order are always understandably reluctant to compile lists of those committed to the cause. The Immortal Seven, who invited William of Orange to invade England in 1688, for example, did not name those they felt they could rely on to support a Dutch invasion, and only signed the invitation each with a code number. Lists of the faithful are manifestly going to be prime targets for every government spy and renegade wanting to earn some ready cash, and every entry could be a potentially fatal hostage to fortune for those whose allegiance was so recorded. Which is why there are not generally many lists compiled by Jacobites resident in the British Isles of who was a Jacobite. The grand exception in Scotland came in 1705 and 1707, when the Jacobites were obliged to step out of the shadows in order to confirm to Colonel, Colonel Reforme, a brevet Colonel Nathaniel Hook, uh, an Irish officer in French service and Louis XIV's secret envoy to Scotland, that they were willing to rise in support of a French invasion designed to restore the Jacobite king three and eight to the, Rome, to the, to the throne. Otherwise, the Jacobite government at Saint-Germain-en-Laye was very security conscious, and even when leading politicians tried to elicit the names of their peers, the Jacobite court refused to oblige. But early modern parliamentary management, whether by the government or the opposition, required political managers to count heads. Even when the managers in question were organising the political wing of illegal organisations like the Jacobite movement in Scotland, they had to do this. Nonetheless, the leaders of the Scots Jacobites were very careful, and any workdays li workday lists drawn up in places like um, Patrick Steele's Tavern, actually that's a sort of 
very fanciful 19th century version, <laughs> um, used to calculate um, the Cavalier vote have not survived. Presumably they, presumably, they went straight in the fire after they had served their purpose. There was, though, one circumstance where a list of Jacobite stalwarts and sympathisers in the Scots Parliament might survive, other than it being captured by the government and duly archived. If the list in question was being sent to Saint-Germain or an external power with a view to demonstrating Jacobite support in Parliament, and this indeed was the case with the two lists considered below. The roles of Parliament, as they stand, are previously unnoticed, but extensively annotated list of the nobles entitled to sit and the commissioners, i.e. the equivalent of English MPs, elected to Queen Anne's Union Parliament. And an account of Scotland, an account of the present state of Scotland in July 1706. A better known but underused county by county debriefing document written by Harry Stratton, a Jacobite agent usually resident in Edinburgh. Each was a unique product of the time and place where the information was put down on paper. Each was intended to produce a particular result. It is correspondingly worth exploring the provenance of each document in detail. The roles of Parliament is the kind of cheap printed list of those sitting in a given Parliament commonly published in the early 18th century. And indeed, the printing of the roles of Parliament uh, was not well done. The spelling of the names and places is frequently idiosyncratic, to put, to put it mildly, and the identifications are sometimes inaccurate. What makes it significant is the handwritten annotation that has been added to the names of the nobles and commissioners listed. In two different hands are what amount to a series of comments on the political alignments of most of them. The annotations are systematic and not many nobles or commissioners are left unassessed. It thus seems highly likely that considerable effort was put into categorising the great majority of those listed. But what was it for? The roles of Parliament as they stand was given to Colonel Hook by George Gordon, Duke of Gordon, the seated gentleman, on 31st of August 1705, just as Hook was about to leave Scotland. The details of Hook's negotiations, which laid the groundwork for the Franco-Jacobite invasion attempt of 1708, need not concern us here. Hook was primarily interested in persuading the Scots to rise without anything more than the promise of French aid. But, will it, but failing that, he was directed to bargain them down to asking for the absolute minimum of direct French support and prohibited from concluding any kind of a treaty himself. All of which makes the origin and purpose of the roles of Parliament as they stand list rather mysterious. As a Catholic, the Duke of Gordon could not sit in Parliament. So the annotations that make the roles of Parliament as they stand so interesting are very likely to have been written by at least one person other than the Duke. Whoever they were, they clearly had inside knowledge of the politics of the Scots Parliament at the time. But it is not clear what the Duke and the annotators intended to achieve. Hook passed on the copy, uh, the list, a copy of the list to King James, there in his full, full youth. So it is possible Hook was just the courier as far as the Duke and the annotators were concerned. But ultimately, we cannot be sure of their reasoning because we have no idea who they were. It is certain, however, that Hook and the French government were totally uninterested in Scots constitutional politics. When he returned to France and passed on a copy of the list to King James, subsequently lost, it would appear, with most of the Stuart papers, lodged in the Scots College in Paris at the time of the French Revolution. Hook then filed the original. He did not even bother to give it in with his report on his mission. The only reason the list finally ended up in the French Foreign Office archives 
was because almost all of Hooke's papers were seized at the time of his death for fear of embarrassing revelations leaking into the public sphere. The provenance of an account of the present state of Scotland in July 1706 is very different. Captain Harry Stratton, the writer, a long-standing Jacobite agent who acted as the main liaison between Jacobite-inclined parliamentarians and the exiled court, uh, was, was a long-standing uh, Jacobite agent, which is why the Duke of Hamilton chose him to carry a message to Saint-Germain in the hope that the exiled Stuart monarchs could persuade the French government to do something he had been badgering them to do for the previous three years, give him a large quantity of money. The Duke was quite rightly concerned in the summer of 1706 that the managers of the Scottish court party would be bringing all the resources they could spare, plus the support of an army of promises, in order to win a majority in the forthcoming session of Parliament, the politics of which was certain entirely to revolve around the recently negotiated Treaty of Union. The Jacobite King and the Queen Regent Mary of Modena knew in advance that getting the French to send money would be the key objective of Stratton's mission, and they were generally interested in the possibility of achieving a Jacobite restoration through parliamentary action. But in this instance, their interest in parliamentary action was eclipsed by a more exciting possibility that they might secure a major French supported rising in Scotland that would be capable of overthrowing the political order established after 1688. Hence, when Stratton arrived in August 1706, he soon learned that neither the French nor Jacobite governments would send money to Hamilton. But that James was very interested in the state of Scotland, which is why the Jacobite king ordered him to write the account. According to George Lockhart, oops, that's Mary Medina. According to George Lockhart of Carnwath, shameless plug here for an old book of mine, um, what the Jacobite king wanted was, quote, a character of every man in the Scots Parliament as they stood affected to him and were capable to serve him. But the account is a much broader of ass assessment of Scotland than that. Certainly Stratton opens the account with an assessment of the senior officers in the Scots army and the likely sympathies of their subordinates. The account then progresses from county to county through Scotland and has two clear strands to it. The first is an assessment of who has the greatest political influence in the county and the political inclinations of the Shire commissioners and any resident peers. The second is an estimate of the likely popular support for a Jacobite rising. With regard to the second strand, there is definitely a strong inclination towards the positive in his assessment. At one point in the text, Stratton also admits that he has never strayed far beyond the southern lowlands and so could not offer much more than hearsay regarding the political inclinations and the state of public opinion in the west and north of Scotland. What he could comment, comment on more authoritatively were the political in inclinations and general voting pattern of sitting peers and commissioners in the Scots Parliament. Stratton clearly socialised with uh, country party parliamentarians on a regular basis and probably attended some debates in Parliament. His knowledge of these men was thus a great deal better and his text is littered with phrases suggesting he had personal knowledge of the peers and commissioners he was describing. A good-natured man has often said he would never do anything against the king. He is, to my certain knowledge, loyal, a notorious Whig and Hanoverian, did lately to myself express much loyalty. To my knowledge, well affected and a constant adherer to the country party, and so on. Nonetheless, when, the, when reading the document, it is essential to keep in mind that in this strand, Stratton was specifically pursuing Hamilton's agenda. If he was going to persuade Saint-Germain and the French 
that it was to their advantage to give Hamilton the money the Duke needed to defeat a union bill in the Scots Parliament, a starting point had to be that there was sufficient Jacobite anti-slash-anti-union support to swing the vote. Hence, once again, Stratton's analysis, analysis was almost certainly optimistic. So what use are these two analyses? For historians of the Union period, the two sources are a, are a highly, are a highly revealing record. Albeit their primary purpose was to assess the strength of Jacobite support inside and outside Parliament, they also tell us much about those inclined to support the Revolution Settlement, Union and the House of Hanover. Indeed, the roles show with remarkable precision the political makeup of the Scottish Parliament according to the key issue of the time, certainly for the French, dynastic affiliation. Furthermore, Stratton's account helps us to penetrate at least some of the obscurity that confronted Patrick Riley in his attempts to understand further why individuals voted as they did. Of the 235 names listed in the rolls in the late summer of 1705, 93 were identified as Whigs, with 39.5% of the total. Another 19 were listed as belonging to the Squadroni Volante. Second largest was the Jacobite group, with 69 affiliates, 29.3% of those in Parliament. To these can reasonably be added the 54 Tories, accounting for 22.9% of the whole. Together, these last two groupings comprise 52.2% of the nobles and commissioners, which means they had a very slim majority in the Parliament. In the light of this clear indication of how delicately balanced political opinion in the Scottish Parliament was, it is little wonder that the Queen and the Court in London and the Jacobites in Scotland and at Saint-Germain put so much effort into promoting their respective causes. Stratton's detailed assessments of the loyalties and abilities of the commanders of Scotland's armed forces, the whereabouts and strengths of the garrisons, and his careful enumeration of the numbers of soldiers under their command would also have been especially valuable to the French military strategists and may have been one of the pieces of information used to encourage the French to attempt an invasion in 1708. Further encouragement may have come from Stratton's assessment of Jacobite support amongst the commons. One of the most valuable aspects of Stratton's account is his assessment of the strength of support there was for the respective causes below the level of the political elites. Here, however, we shall be clear that his comments relate to the locations and degrees of support there were for the competing socio-political positions. The revolution, Presbyterianism and Queen Anne, and the alternative, a second restoration, Episcopalianism and James VIII, but not Union. It is beyond doubt that there was little enthusiasm for the proposed incorporating union amongst ordinary people in 1706-7, if not outright anger at the prospect. Yet on the religious dynastic issue, it seems that opinion was much more evenly divided. A case in point is Lanarkshire, the populace of which was generally Whiggish. On the union question, however, we know that the county was among the loudest and most united in its opposition to incorporation, with ardent Jacobites such as Lockhart of Carnwath joining forces with true blue Presbyterians in opposing this. Stratton's comments were invariably brief, optimistic, and largely impressionistic. But even so, he felt confident enough to distinguish parts of the country that were loyal or well affected to the Jacobite king, or alternatively, Whig. This, for Stratton, was a clearly identifiable division. Albeit his analysis is generalised, patchy, and overly optimistic, what Stratton perceived was a degree of political commitment at the lower levels of Scottish society 
hitherto overlooked by most historians. That Stratton identified substantial bodies of loyal citizens in the Lowlands prior to the uh, 1707 Union is of considerable importance historiographically. It confirms a sizeable Jacobite presence in Scotland in the wake of the revolution, especially amongst Episcopalians, and this not only in the northeast but in the lowlands more generally. Furthermore, Stratton's analysis provides us with evidence of just how widespread identification with the Jacobites was and where precisely that support lay. What the account shows is that there were potential recruiting grounds for the Jacobites in the south, or, if not this, there was certainly widespread sympathy for the cause that predated 1707. There are, of course, limits on how far this argument can be taken. It is more difficult to form firm conclusions about some towns and counties than others. References to many loyalists amongst the common people in Edinburgh, Berwick, Linlithgow and Stirling are much less convincing than the greater certainty that most were loyal in Angus, Fife, Kincardine, Inverness and Elgin. Stratton was even more sure of the loyal inclinations of the gentry. This was notably so in Middle Othian, Berwickshire, Roxburghshire, Peeblesshire, Lanarkshire, Dumfriesshire and 14 other counties. He forthrightly admitted there were many smaller towns, even in the lowlands, about which he knew little or nothing. Nonetheless, the number of localities identified as largely Jacobite is impressive. Stratton also, however, identified other places as staunchly Whig. Edinburgh, Dumbarton, Linlithgow, Dundee were, isted, uh, were all listed as urban Whig strongholds. In addition, there were clearly Whiggish counties, Dumfries, Lanarkshire, Ayrshire, Renfrewshire and Kincardineshire. That in a small number of counties, the sympathies of the common people differed from the local nobility and the elected commissioners is worth commenting upon too. In Renfrewshire, for instance, the gentry were reputed to be well affected, but the commons were for the most part Whiggish. The same was true of Dumfriesshire as well as Ayrshire. The most striking example, however, is Lanark, where despite the dominance of the county, uh, by the county, uh, dominance in the county of the Hamilton family, Stratton reported that the commons of this country are generally Whiggish and constant, consequently not well affected. It was among the higher echelons of society and within the formal political system that personal and familial influences may have had greater impact. Testimony to the authority and powers of patronage wielded by Scotland's magnates over some of their peers, but more, more so those of, lower, of lesser rank is also provided in Stratton's account. The Argyle, Hamilton and Queensbury interests are the most prominent of those associated with the management of parliamentary commissioners. Given the importance of the Squadroni for the successful passage of the Articles of Union through the Scottish Parliament, Stratton's observations about how influential the Earl of Roxburgh, Roxburgh and his allies were are telling. But what is most striking about the two documents is that they emphatically point to a political nation that was sharply divided between the supporters of the revolution settlement and those who wanted to reject it in favour of a second Jacobite restoration. That, individual, that individuals were designated in our sources primarily as Whigs and Jacobites tends to su support the proposition that the revolution of 1688-9 to may have been the fundamental dividing line rather than personal loyalty. It certainly was for the Squadroni. In this view, political pr principle as defined by re religious affiliation, Presbyterianism versus Episcopalianism in Roman Catholicism, and competing approaches to monarchy, divine right and absolute as opposed to constitutional, were the main determinants of one's political position. Perhaps surprisingly, the roles and Stratton's analysis 
reveal relatively few parliamentarians who were regarded as straightforwardly unprincipled and available for hire. 93 Whigs were, moreover, not sufficient to carry the Union, even with the support of the 19 Squadroni. Thus, to achieve a working majority, the court needed to persuade at least half a dozen Jacobites or Tories to join them. With a parliament of 235 members, this was only a tiny fraction, hardly enough to justify older depictions of the Union as a political job, an argument that has become increasingly difficult to sustain. Who these men were forms part of Stratton's account. To take only three, the Earl of Mar, William Morrison of Preston Grange and Lord Bellenden had all formally identified as Jacobites, but by 1706 had been bought with offers of honour or government office. At the same time, during the winter of 1705-6, the Squadroni's numbers increased and their 25 adherents were crucial in securing the passage of the Union. So where do these two Jacobite analyses leave us? Ah, the Parliament, Queen Anne, and oh, back. Yes, I missed out some things. Never mind, there we go. So where do these two Jacobite analyses leave us? In the first instance, they offer a unique and fascinating glimpse of the Jacobite perception of the strengths and weaknesses of the political parties struggling for control of the Scots Parliament. The Scots Jacobite movement's political wing was more powerful in Queen Anne's Parliament than Jacobites were to be in any other Parliament of the 18th century. And in Scotland, nothing else like the roles or the account has survived the vicissitudes of the Jacobite risings and subsequent centuries of archival happenstance. More broadly, the roles indirectly and the account directly shine a new light on the state of opinion in the country on the eve of the Union debates. Harry Stratton's analysis has to be read and used with care, but there is nothing else like it. It is a systematic attempt to assess the mood of the Scottish nation by a seasoned political agent. He undoubtedly wanted to produce a particular result, money for Hamilton, by his secret visit to Saint-Germain. But he also sought loyally and honestly to answer the Jacobite King's fundamental question. Who were his friends and who were his enemies and how were they distributed across the nation? What the roles in the account revealed too is more than the annotators or Stratton intended. Though it is clear from both that Scotland was very narrowly divided in 1705 to 7, it was the marginal, more venal Jacobites and Tories who cast the balance in favour of the Union. Whereas the Squadroni and other Whig alignments grew in strength and resolution, crucial numbers of men like Marr, Bellenden, and Morrison of Preston Grange changed sides, if not for English gold, then the prospect or equivalent of it. Ironically, it seems that wavering on the part of a handful of fringe Jacobites and Tories may have been the critical political weakness that brought the Union to pass. <clears throat> Hamilton's repeated pleas for money with which to stop the Union may not then have been entirely self-serving. If he could have bought and sold the venal men on the fringes of the Jacobite slash Tory block, the Union Bill might have been defeated, with who knows what consequences for the history of Scotland and England. Thank you.